to the 6 p.m. special council meeting of July 12th, 2022. Let the roll call reflect that all council members are present. Um, first item on our agenda is opening ceremony. I'll defer to Vice Chair Lopez for the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, please rise if you're able and repeat after me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you. Please consider joining us for a brief moment of silence. Thank you. Next item on our agenda is acknowledgements and I'll first start by acknowledging the obvious. The room is packed. Clearly we've made some mistakes somewhere and we'll find out soon what it was. Um, no, it's good to see all of you. We know we have uh, important issues on the agenda this evening, so thank you for joining us. Council colleagues, is there anything else you'd like to acknowledge tonight? Okay, I'll also uh, acknowledge some of the staff that are here. Um, we've got Ginger and Ed, staff with our Recreation Division. Thank you for all the work you guys are doing to bring the Triple Crown here, as well as everybody in the community that helped bring the event here. We've got, what, 50 or 60 softball teams in town from all over the country, mostly from California. Um, there's like 4,000 people, families that came to Ogden to help make their kids better. So thanks to everybody that's helping to make that possible. Okay, first item on our agenda, which I think you all are here for, is public hearing, fiscal year 2022-2023 budget. We'll have our own Janine Eller-Smith, Executive Director for the Council Office, give us a brief presentation. Thank you, Chair Nadolsky. I am unusually nervous. Um, and I was just thinking, well, if I do pass out, I'm lack, lucky that there's somebody here to take care of me, so. <laughs> <laughs> that said, don't pass out. I won't. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm just going to take a real quick um, minute to talk about the process that we've done to this point for the FY23 budget. Um, you know, the mayor introduced his budget May 3rd. You had multiple work sessions through June, uh, through June. Um, on June 7th, you adopted the tentative budget. On the 14th, you adopted the RDA and the MBA budget. Today is the first of two public hearings on the budget, and the second one will be held August 2nd. Uh, by state law, you have to have the budget adopted by September 1st. Just a quick overview of the numbers and changes over the adopted 22 and, and the FY23 proposed. Um, this is, you can see that the general fund that includes the additional money, $3 million, um, that is proposed for the tax increase. Um, the total $37 million uh, over what was what was adopted in FY22 includes that 28 and a half million dollars from ARPA. So um, this is just a total of Ogden City Corporation. Um, so Ogden City with that 17% um, change, you've already adopted the redevelopment agency and the municipal building authority budgets and Ogden City serves as the financial, um, the fiscal agent for Weber Morgan Strike Force, and so all of those add up to $267 million. When the mayor um, and most of the directors made their presentations on the FY23 budget, um, all of them said this budget, this budget is a focus on the employees. But I think it really goes beyond that. Um, 
So, you know, there are increases for existing employees to bring them to market rate. Um, we're, we're seeing, um, based on information from HR, that there's a 13% turnover in regular employees. It's maybe even higher than that in police and fire. Uh, other jurisdictions are, are really poaching some of our really good employees. Um, across, and all of this is across the organization. You know, we just lost an attorney, um, and it's just a very competitive market. Um, in addition, though, there are 28 new positions that are proposed, and that sort of goes to the fact that our, how overworked the existing employees are. I mean, that, uh, it's a lot of new employees, but I think if you go through the list and you know what you heard during the budget and, a, and actually throughout the year, you can, you can see why they're asking for those new positions. And of course, just inflation hits the city just like it hits individuals. And, and so we're gonna talk a little bit about that as well. For the rest of my presentation, I decided to just focus on the property tax increase because I think that's what most people will be interested in. Um, and it's not my intent to argue for and against a property tax. As you know, our, our informal uh, office motto is we don't get paid to have opinions. Um, but we do. I do want to present some information that you've heard during your um, work sessions with the departments and from the mayor as he made his presentation. And I just would like to remind uh, the residents um, that in the last 35 or 40 years, uh, Ogden City has only in increased their taxes tax rate three times. And that was in consecutive 26, 2017, and 2018. So I'm going to uh, talk about frequent comments that we have heard either in prior years and we're hearing them again uh, and uh, one new one that was that I'd like to that I thought I would address so the first comment we it's always the first one is like wait a minute my property value is just too high you know you guys are crazy my house isn't worth that much money um, so it's a great observation um, I did some uh, crunched some numbers and found out that from 21 to 22, the average property value increase in Ogden was 34%. For uh, the elected officials, all of you that are seated up there, mayor's missing, but I included him, the average increase of your property values was 36.27. The reason I wanted to uh, include the elected officials um, is because I know that when the mayor proposed a tax increase, he was a proposing a tax increase on himself. And when you are considering a tax increase, you're considering a tax increase on yourself. You're all Ogden residents. But back to property valuations. Um, as you know, but maybe residents don't, Ogden City doesn't have any influence on the valuation of property in Ogden City. That uh, <laughs> goes to Weber County Assessor's Office. And so uh, if you have an issue with your valuation, uh, this is who is responsible for that. Uh, where is their Instagram here? <laughs> um, if, um, I, I wanted to say that there have been several articles written about Ogden's values being so over, overrated. You may have seen some of those. And when you get your property um, valuation, if you haven't already, um, maybe you want to take a look at filing a protest and see if you can get a lower property value. Leave that up long enough for everybody to get a picture of that <laughs> shot. So that, uh, uh, now's your time. <laughs> and I just wanted to add that the, uh, your uh, protests go to my friend Ricky Hatch at the county. Um, and there is a <laughs> September 15th deadline to file that. So. That's not a lot of turnaround. If you get your uh, tax valuations, you might want to pull together some information that makes your case that your property's not that as, as highly valued as maybe it shows on your property tax. So the frequent, another num comment that we hear, or 
hey, your, my home value has increased, so Ogden's tax revenues are already increasing. You shouldn't need to raise my taxes because you're getting all that extra money on the extra value of my home. Um, we hear this really often, and it's a great opportunity to review how property tax law in Utah works uh, because an increase in property value does not automatically generate additional property tax for the city or other taxing entities. So we want to talk about the certified tax rate. The certified tax rate is designed for revenue neutrality, and that means that um, the city is allowed to receive only an amount of property re tax revenue that they received the previous year, plus any new growth. So the current rate for, and for 2021, the, the property tax rate was 002397, about 17 and a half of the total property tax bill. And that rate generate, generates $15.8 million in property tax revenues. This is, I know that you can't read this, but I wanted you to, to see this because this is the right off the state, state tax commission's website, and it shows exactly how they calculate the certified tax rate. So they're looking at the real property, so that's land, permanent fixtures, any buildings that are on it, personal property, which is equipment, and then centrally assessed property, and that is property that are that is owned by companies that operate in multiple jurisdictions throughout the state. So that could be Rocky Mountain Power, Questar, the railroads, like that. To calculate that rate, so they take all that real personal and central property and that gives you the total current value of Ogden City, for example. And then they subtract any monies that are going um, to redevelopment agencies under the, that tax increment agreements. And then they kind of make an adjustment for board of adjustments. So if somebody's appealed their property tax and, and that needs to be plus or minus. And then they adjust for a collection rate because they don't collect 100% of property tax every year. And that, that gives you sort of the proposed tax rate value. And then they subtract any new growth off of that because we're allowed to, to gain new growth. And then they just uh, do some, uh, some division, and then that, that pumps out the certified tax rate. So the proposal for the certified tax rate is, um, uh, sorry, the actual certified tax rate is 0 0.0014. And that is the rate that would generate $15.8 million, which is what we made in 2021, plus the new growth. Um, the current rate from 2021 is 0.002397, and the proposed rate is a little bit lower, and that would generate 19.3 million, which is that extra $3 million that the mayor has requested uh, through this tax increase. I'd like to show this, this graph in case anybody doesn't believe me when I say that the rate has gone down. Um, so this is from 2002 to 2022. Um, you can see that it's most, um, it's mostly gone down. Um, the upticks uh, were when the tax rate increased, but it's not because Ogden increased the rate, but because valuations dropped significantly, which meant the rate to generate the same amount of money that they received the previous year needed to increase. And that automatic increase is not considered a tax increase under Utah law. So you can see 2002 to 2005, that was the dot-com bubble. Uh, 2008 to 2012, that was the housing bubble when you know, the bank failures. Um, 2016 to 2018, the city maintained that rate, so it's a straight line. And then you can see how it's fallen off because 2000. Um, 18 was the last time that the city did a tax increase. This uh, graph shows um, with the certified tax rate as proposed by the, the state com uh, tax commission. And this graph shows that if we adopted what is proposed um, by the administration, 
that it's lower than what you're, they're currently paying, but it is higher than the certified tax rate. So it's still a downward slope, but it's not quite so extreme. So I know that's really technical, but hopefully that explains a little bit why the city doesn't automatically get increased property tax revenue when values, home values go up. So uh, council member hire asks me this question every year. Uh, tax rates are going down, you tell me, but my tax rate taxes never do. So how is, why is that? I have talked to a lot of people uh, and asked them this question, and nobody's quite sure, except I think I have a few reasons or explanations. So we do know that um, the county only um, assesses properties a, a quarter of the city at a time, right? They're making changes. Um, so there might be bigger increases in one section as in another. This is how the, the, the certified tax rate is calculated. So any changes that are in centrally assessed or personal property valuations are going to ultimately affect the valuation which could impact the total uh, rate. But I also found this, that... Um, other taxing entities periodically are increasing their tax rates, even though Ogden City hasn't done that. Um, so it could be that another entity is increasing theirs, and that's why you're seeing an increase in your in tax rates. So here's a comparison. You can see in 2002, Ogden City's portion of the tax, uh, the full property tax bill was 24%. In 2021, it was 17%. And by contrast, you can see that the school district has gone from 45 to 54%. I also um, found out that in 2002, there were only 11 taxing entities. And in 2021, there are actually 13, but there was one year when there was an, an additional 114. Um, so yeah, we had um, Weber 911 came on in 2006. There was a state charter levy that came on in 2017. Um, and there was an Ogden school judgment levy that was just for 2014. Uh, and that was just that one year. We're in good company. Uh, there's lots of other entities that are proposing tax increases. Um, Ogden schools, Weber schools, Harrisville, um, Riverdale. I, I don't know if anybody read the article. Um, they interviewed Mayor Tate from Harrisville explaining the 166% tax increase. And she mentioned that in the past, uh, they had cut staff rather than um, increase taxes. And they just found that it was caused a lot of overburdens for existing staff. And it ended up reducing the services that they could provide for their city. This is another um, one that we hear, you know, you should just cut costs instead of raising taxes. And, you know, that's a reasonable suggestion. And I think if residents have listened to the budget discussions as you have, the department directors um, have, are always looking for ways to cut to, for cost savings. Um, we have very experienced department heads, and they've always been asked to do more with, with less and They've just found ways to do that. And the trouble is, is that those same impacts that residents are feeling in terms of higher costs in their, you know, to run their homes um, is also felt by the city. Um, I first showed this, me, this uh, slide in 2016. You know, uh, it's, you know, inflation silently robbing you of purchasing power since 1913. 1913 was the first year that the federal government started calculating a consumer price index. And so uh, this just happens to show from 98, 2005, 2014, the difference in what $20 would buy. Uh, you know, in 2022, you don't even need the cart. You can just put it in your pocket, right? Um, Here's another slide that shows the same thing. That same basket of goods and services over time ends up costing more and more money. And the cumulative rate from 2002 to, 20, to 2022, it was 62.5%. So as I like to do, just 
for fun, um, take a look at what the budget was 20 years ago and, and then ap apply that, um, bring it to a present value using that inflation rate calculation. And that gives you sort of what the present value of the budget would have been in 2002. And then compare that to what's proposed in the, tw in the 2023 budget. So you can see that uh, there's a difference of $3.6 million, 22%. Now that includes the $3 million that the, uh, the administration is suggesting you, that the city get through a tax increase. If you took out the $3 million, that difference is about 4%. Um, sales tax, we're doing great on sales tax. Uh, it's been booming the last couple of years. The thing about sales tax is it's not, um, a, it's not especially stable because it's, it's very um, subject to market, market conditions. And so, you know, it might be, uh, we might get 26 million uh, this year, but maybe next year we only get 20 because something terrible happens in the market. Um, and so that's, that's one issue with the sales tax, even though it's been great um, in the last few years. So you can see franchise tax, other revenues are just slightly above what we had uh, 20 years ago. When I first made this presentation in 2016, the city actually had less money than we had in 2022. So we're, or sorry, in 2002. So we are doing a, at least a little bit better, but it doesn't really acknowledge that during that period of time, those 20 years, there's been increased services, increased growth, um, but just only minimal increases in the budget. Ogden City has higher tax rates than other cities. You should learn from them. That is a fair observation. Ogden City does have a higher tax rate than a lot of people. In fact, as long as I've been looking at tax rates, we've been number three behind Salt Lake and West Valley. And I put some others up there just for comparison. Um, you can see the outlier is Bountiful, and you can think of lots of reasons why Bountiful would be so low. Um, you know, remember, high property values, low rates. The other thing is that not all cities are created equal. Um, the average home value in Park City is $2. million, and I put there, I was actually surprised at how high their rate was. Uh, the average townhome was $1.5 million in Park City. The average property in Ogden is $410,000. If you think about it, it probably costs about the same to provide police and fire service and parks and road maintenance uh, to a home that it's valued at $2.9 million as it does to a home that's $410,000. And in fact, it might actually even cost more because we have older infrastructure, we have older build buildings, we may have more crime. All of those things factor into the fact that that's why we have higher rates and lower property values. I just thought I'd throw this in because this was something, a few things that I hadn't thought of. 40% of the property in Ogden is tax exempt. That means they don't pay property taxes. So uh, because we are an urban center, we have a lot of county and state and federal buildings. All of those are tax exempt. We love Weber State, but they don't, we don't get any proper tax revenue from Weber State. Um, we, because we're an urban center, we have a higher daytime population, which means there's additional services that are required for that population. And then, uh, for a city, we are a lower density city. I know that one of the things that um, Tom in, from CED and now Brandon has been uh, working towards is getting a higher density because it actually reduces the cost per capita of services. Um, an increase of 18% is too high. You know, you should just do maybe a four or 5% increase. That's more reasonable. It's a really good suggestion, but remember, the certified tax rate, um, when, in 2016, when the city made the decision to do that first tax increase, the goal was, that was discussed was to main that, maintain that rate over year over year. And the first year was 
increase was 31%. And that was, um, it was so high because we were trying to capture a, a revenue bond, that, or uh, sorry, a GO bond that was paying off. And then in 2017, it was 7.2% to maintain that rate. In, in 2018, it was 8.2%, 8, 8 so less than 10%. So we did that for three years, and then there was kind of a change in philosophy. It's like, well, maybe we should just do it every other year. Um, and then, so we missed 2019, and then everybody knows what happened in 2020. So since then, uh, we've lost a lot of revenue. Inflation's still accumulating. And I, I did actually calculate that if we had maintained the rate from 2018, um, you know, we, we lost several million dollars uh, of revenue in not, not doing those tax increases then. So now, now we're just sort of, the proposal is we, we need to sort of catch up. And, and there's, that's where it goes to this. Now this is a new comment that I hadn't heard until this year. Um, but I thought it was interesting because I've worked for Ogden City for 25 years. I've worked in municipal government for almost 30. And my guess is that everybody, uh, police and fire that are in this room would uh, acknowledge that they can't do their jobs without the support of all of the other uh, uh, employees in the city. So I just wanted to remind you of the Evergreen report. This was completed in 2019. That's when all the data was gathered, 2019. Uh, they were gonna bring to, us, to you the council early, in early 2020, but it got postponed. We know why, because of COVID. Um, and then we couldn't implement it all at once because um, the costs were just so high. We were so far behind um, what the other market rates in the area were. So in the Evergreen study, um, the Evergreen Company um, did benchmarks against 12 other jurisdictions, Provo City, Davis County, Weaver County, North Ogden and South Ogden, Hill Air Force Base, South Jordan, West Jordan, Salt Lake City, and at three different water basin conservancy districts. Um, so those are the groups that are competing for the employees that we have. Um, it wasn't until April of this year, so almost three years later, uh, to get full implementation of that Evergreen report. And so during those three years, there hasn't been any adjustment to the recommendations that came from them in terms of wages, no cost of living. Um, during that report, I, I glanced at it yesterday. I hadn't actually read it for a while, and it talks about some of the interviews that they did with Ogden City employees. Um, a lot of people said, yeah, they're getting recruited and for more money, they, but they really love Ogden, they'd like to stay, but at, but at some point, for their own family's sake, you know, they can't always stay. I think I mentioned the average turnover for non-police and fire uh, is 13%. Some departments, uh, it mentioned in the Evergreen, had as high as 50% turnover. Um, so that leaves that the remaining employees really overburdened. We're losing institutional knowledge and losing experience. And so that benchmarking only addresses salary and benefits. It's not talking about productivity or, and the things that are lost when we lose that turnover. One thing that I was struck uh, by when the department directors made their presentations, um, Chief Matthew from the fire department reported that costs almost $70,000 to train a firefighter. And you know, if we're not paying them enough, we're gonna pay to train them. And as soon as they get trained, then they're gonna go for greener pastures. Same with police officers, it's 85 to $90,000 to train a police officer. But I also just recently found out that in public services, it costs about $65,000 to train some of their water technicians and some of the other people, those that, heavy equipment operators, because they all need certain certifications, they need CDLs. So there's a lot of expense that goes into that training. So if you're spending money to train people, you want to do what you can to hire them, uh, to retain them. Um, I also wanted to just point out 
that you know police and fire take are 57 percent of general fund salaries and benefits if you add public services in there that's 72 percent so public cert we all know what police and fire do but public services they're out there maintaining the roads they're maintaining the fire hydrants they're maintaining the parks and the cemeteries they run all the recreation programs they're maintaining the trails and building them and these are all quality of life issues that I think people in Ogden really care about. Management services, they provide justice, justice court services, fleet and facilities, maintenance, accounting, payroll, insurance benefits. Police and fire need all of those services to be able to do their jobs. The attorney's office, they're prosecuting the cases that are police bringing them, and they also work to minimize any liabilities that the city might incur. Um, had just a new comment come in today you know, you should be out there getting more businesses in so that we get new growth and nobody has to have a tax increase. And well, that's exactly what CED is trying to do. They're, in fact, in 2021, they generated five and a half, five and a half million dollars, five, $550 million worth of extra taxes. So that, re, that new growth is really important. They also are managing the arts programs and Union Station, all, also quality of life issues. And then just a tiny amount is your professional staff that support you and, the, and that support the mayor and what he does. So the proposed tax raise, the current rate is, as I said, 0 .2, 0 .002397. Um, the certified rate was 0 0.00194, and the proposed rate, lower than the current rate, but higher than the certified, is 0 0.2306. So that is an 18.83 increase in the rate. So that is my presentation. I don't know if you have any questions for me. <clears throat> First, before we take questions, good job not passing out. OK, thanks. <laughs> and just so the crowd knows, Janine is certified to argue in front of the United States Supreme Court, <laughs> for real, and she's not nervous about that. <clears throat> It'd be the worst case of uh, malpractice you'd ever <laughs> see, but. <laughs> but it goes to show how highly she thinks of everybody in the room, so <laughs> thanks, Janine. Any questions from the council for, for Janine? Thank you. Janine, uh, just we, real we got one here. sorry, just real quick. Um, so you said a percentage of the general fund, you know, you showed that, that pie chart. Um, do you know what the dollar amount is of the general fund, the total general fund? Salaries and benefits, I do, but I don't have it with me right now. I can look it up if you want. And it's the total, like, you, and, and the other, the, I think the, the other misnomer is that I, property taxes don't even pay for the police salaries. Right. So um, I, I guess that, that if you, yeah, that, that's a, a comment that that's needs true. to be made. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I was just doing some back of the envelope math, about as dangerous as you in front of the Supreme Court. And if not for the new growth that did come from efforts by a CED, we'd be at least 3% higher in the proposed increase as well. Um, okay, this is a public hearing. This is your opportunity to address the council on the fiscal year 2022-2023 budget. Um, if you care to address the council, Please limit your comments to three minutes and state your name for the record. I'm guessing there's a number of you that have similar comments. So for example, if there's one group all wearing similar uniforms, you might want to designate a, a spokesperson, um, someone other than Deputy Chief Slater. Just kidding. <laughs> I love Deputy Chief Slater. Had to give him a little bit of crap. Um, but if you have groups that are, want to express the same sentiment, um, feel free to organize yourselves and send a spokesperson if you wish. Um, so we'll start with uh, Chair. Can I just real quick? Just yeah. I, I think Janine touched on it, but just to make sure that everyone understands that this is the first of two public hearings. Thank and you. So, if someone speaks, wants to say something else, we there is another opportunity on August second. So. Yep. Perfect. Good point. Thank you, Councilmember Blair. Mm -hmm. Okay. If you care to address the council, please step to the podium, state your name for the record, and limit your comments to three minutes. My name is Kathy Renner, and I'm an Ogden City resident, and I have been working with Ogden City for 19 years in this, co this coming October, 18 years in engineering. I started as a senior office assistant with regular duties. 
When the contract administrator retired, those duties fell to me with a three cent raise. A few years later, a small increase was, I was given a small pay raise and a job title contract technician. There have been several years without any pay increase as I was topped out in my range, as were several others. My duties are not entry, letter, entry level, nor are they cookie cutter. There isn't much time to build my base income for retirement. Last October, my rent was due to increase from $650 to $1,050, but they allowed me one more year at the lower rate. I've always kept my bills down and stayed out of serious debt. This October, my rent will go up to $1,250 for a studio apartment. I live over by the Ogden Temple. I asked my boss if I can still work at Ogden City while living in the homeless shelter, and I was serious. This past raise hike would have kept me off the streets, but now I found that my rent will increase more than the raise I received. My rent will double, and I have no way to pay for it and everything else that I need. We have had over $150 million, $155 million of outside funding sources for public services over the, um, since 2008. 95% of the engineering contracts and payments have processed through me. I was publicly recognized on three different occasions for being part of the Ogden River team. We re reconstructed the Ogden River just before the 2011 flood, which would have flooded the city had that project not been completed. Because of these additional funds, the comptrollers, purchasing, treasury, recorders, and other divisions have had a tremendous volume of work added to their already daunting load. I want to thank Heidi Omedo for her extraordinary efforts to keeping our health benefits costs down. The city prides itself on being first and the best, except for the employee wages. For years, we were benchmarked with other cities that held to the mid-range salaries. The other cities didn't have a position like mine. Then the benefits comp compensation study was completed that shows there were many, many positions underpaid. There have been several employees in our division in the last several years that have left for significantly pay, higher pay, paying jobs with work less loads with work less load, work less workload, sorry. Please do what you can to help the employees to have a chance to build their retirement and keep their homes so they won't be out on the streets because they can't pay, make their payments. The great resignation and gray homeless is real and it's, it's hitting the city. I just want to thank you sincerely for opening this up for all of us, for even trying to do this type of a, a rate increase. Thank you. Thanks, Kathy. Okay, it's not easy for me. This is Sebastian Benitez from Ogden resident for 21 years. Um, I wanna clarify my last participation I mentioned, I will ask the resignation for the mayor. Um, that is just for the, um, I support this budget. I agree, we need to pay better our workers, our police department, the fire department. The proposal in my understanding is behind. They propose 13% and my understanding, the worker need 20% and the firefighter, they are behind 18%. Uh, with the police department. I am fighting from 2015 when I ran the first time and I was talking many, many times about budget and the high salaries and the compensation. I provide this document for, for you guys. I request for you investigation the mayor proposal is for, for three, around $3 million in property taxes. If we cut the high salary and the second salary for around 96 people, we can save $5 million, three, five point, uh, five million three, uh, $436.39. More than whatever we need to pay better these guys. I support you guys, you deserve better. For the last seven years, I am fighting for them and I talk with them. I told the ship, we need 30%, no 12%. 
and I hope you approve this budget, but modify this budget, cutting high, tax, high salaries. There is the information. You can see what's going on in this administration around extra money taking the people, you know, regular salary, 167,000 plus 67,000 for bonus, you know, and everyone, his friend or the other people involving in this, in my understanding, have to stop, have to stop. Ronald Reagan said that we the people determine what the government have to do. And please guys, look the budget, look the salaries, high salaries they are receiving and cut that one. It's not just for, Luis Lopez is my hero too because he said I don't want it, high my salary. Everybody have to do the same. Thank you. Thanks Sebastian. Hello, uh, my name is Kira Hudson, and I'm coming here in a spirit of a citizen of Ogden. I've lived here for 33 years. Uh, both my children were born here, went to Ogden City Schools, public schools. I teach at Weber State. I've taught there for th over 30 years. And I um, appreciate that breakdown of the budget. That was very informative, um, uh, Jack and Janine. Thank you so much. But there are also some other, I'm coming from, uh, a very medium range income, I, Weber State, average salary at Weber State is $42,000. Um, I cannot afford to, to, to pay my property tax here in Ogden anymore. We moved and stayed here in Ogden because we could afford to, to buy a house here and live here. And um, I don't know, again, all these conflicting numbers, like these high salaries, I saw these different numbers, crunch numbers, and benefit packages, and I'm not going to go into those details. I have all of this. I had some help in my research, and it's all backed up with uh, uh, websites and uh, government documents. But the point is that Ogden City does have the second highest tax, tax rate in Utah, property tax rate. Only, I think, Iron County is the, the first one. Uh, we have a higher property tax rate than Salt Lake, Sandy, Lehigh, Provo, Park City, all areas that have higher income jobs. And that's my point, is I don't think you can really put the, the, all these numbers and figures and, and, and the heartbreaking uh, testimony of your city employee. I mean, no one, I don't, I don't begrudge anyone a good salary, but it can't be on the backs of Ogden City residents who don't make that kind of money. We just don't make the money. My property tax now, I went into that truth of taxation uh, website that you have on your um, on the Ogden City website, and now you've already uh, added on to my property tax almost four thousand dollars, and you value my house at uh, five four hundred and ninety two thousand, right? And I when I bought we bought our house for forty eight thousand when we moved up here <laughs> thirty three years ago. Uh, so I'm just wondering how am I supposed to come up with four thousand dollars for a house that is valued that I don't make that, inc I'm not in that income bracket. You know, my husband nor I are in that income bracket. And I understand all these, pay I don't think there's any person here that, that doesn't want to see uh, employees uh, uh, fairly compensated. And I have to agree with Mr. Benitez, I was very shocked at the high salaries of the upper echelons of Ogden City employees. I'm sorry, That's, that is just uh, that your city manager makes more than the governor of Utah does leave you know a person a little bit speechless uh, <laughs> and uh, on the list goes on down so I think that maybe the budget could be re, re, re con, you know configured but um, also I just uh, I find it you know I ask you really deeply again and, and from the best intentions to reconsider your budget here and not put the burden on the average person in Ogden thank you Zach Nold. So I'm a detective here over vehicle theft and property crimes for Ogden City. My wife, I sure can. My wife is a detective over child sex crimes, which includes sex abuse. Um, 
I come to you not necessarily as an officer. I just happen to be working right now, but as somebody who's making a personal comment, my wife and I have been trying to have children for years. We are unable to do so, which means that we have gone down the adoption route, foster care, private adoption, and every rabbit hole I can dive down to get my wife a child that she deserves to raise and love. Um, I have an MBA in business, and after I learned the statistics and hired companies to go through the adoption process, uh, it was staggering to understand that less than 50,000 babies will be adopted this year. And there are millions of other people like me, including public workers who are in this room and work for the city that are trying to save and work overtime to hopefully give a baby a home that they deserve. Now, as an officer who also used to work over child sex crimes himself, there are people in this world who are willing to give up their children, but we have a capitalist society that if you're gonna make money, they're gonna figure out how to do it. The fees are usually in excess of 30 to 40,000, oftentimes going 50 to 60,000. The notion that you can go out of country and make it cheaper is completely wrong. We have looked into that extensively. We have family members in other countries who've asked for us and they simply do not want their children to come to the US unless it's through a very private entity because they wanna to try to keep their heritage, which I completely respect. This raise is more than just a new truck. It's not even something to buy or put more food on my table. It's so that I can try to stop working overtime so I can see my wife more, so I can be home, so I can try to create the environment that that future child deserves, no matter who he or she is or where they come from. And it's so that I can pay that fee when the time's right on top of taking care of that kid for the next 18 years, which on average is going to be two to 400,000. So I just want to thank you guys and let you know that it's important to me personally, not as an officer, but just as a person. Thank you. Thank you, Officer Nold. My name is John Thomas. I'm the uh, FOP Vice President for uh, Weaver Lodge Number no. One. I represent the majority of the Ogden City Police officers as well as uh, civilian employees. I'm Detective Ann Stellman. I also represent the Ogden Police Benefit Association. I'm the president. Do more local support and just support our officers. I want to thank you for giving us this moment to speak with you. Uh, I think today you guys feel like police officers. You're in a tough situation. Nobody's going to be happy with the decision you make. And, and honestly, this is how a lot of the officers feel when they're out there on the street daily. Um, and they're not here to, to, get, to get rich. I've been with the city in some facet for over 24 years. And I've been through the hard times. Uh, and I, I stuck it out when other officers fled to Salt Lake. I stayed because I like Ogden City. These men and women behind me on both sides of the aisle, we stay because we like Ogden City. Um, I think sometimes the citizens of Ogden, they don't realize what they have. They have Ferrari service, but they're getting uh, paying Volkswagen fees. It's there. You got some of the best men and women working for this city to keep it up and running. And all they want is a, a competitive salary so they can feed their families and they can live in Ogden. I spoke with some of you uh, a couple of weeks ago and I told you that I'm doing recruiting for the city. And I'm getting a lot of people to come to the city and work for the city because it's a great city. They can't afford to live in this city because they, the wages aren't there. We have to continue this. I heard the uh, Evergreen uh, study being brought up. We have to continue moving forward. We realize that those are 2019 numbers. We cannot afford to sit behind and get further behind. So I understand the hard situation that you guys are facing, uh, the CAO, and I appreciate you taking us on. We support you and we hope that you can stay the course and fund the uh, raises for the members. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Council Members. Thank you.
That was very clever, Officer Thomas used uh, foreign cars for his analogy. <laughs> Good job, officer. My name is Angela French, and I uh, am a resident here in Ogden City. I haven't, I haven't attended a council meeting before. Um, I probably won't make any friends, but I do have some uh, just thoughts to discuss on the introduction. Um, I notice there's a lot of elderly here. I work for elderly. I investigate abuse, neglect, exploitation, those kind of things. Um, they're a very intellectual group. They have knowledge that we don't have years of that. And I just think it, the approach could be more respectful in that when proposing ideas, I understand she's nervous and I have to give her credit for that, but to say this is very technical, it involves division, um, th those kind of things. Um, or to say, I think it came across that we don't really want to hear anyone, that she is very expert in what she does and not to question that. And, and I would like to see more discussion and um, people feeling comfortable to voice their concerns. I have some very specific ideas that I would recommend in this. I heard about turnover. I work for the state. I probably take home $2,200 a month. I can relate to being a public servant. It is a huge sacrifice in, in salary and time and stress. It's, it's quite a burden. But I would argue that there, I don't know specifics, but in working with law enforcement in Salt Lake City, I'm aware that they have had extreme turnovers as well in their departments that has nothing to do with income. Uh, there's a lot of other factors there. Um, I wish for an increase for employees too, but I would like that to come to the bottom and to the middle employees. The specific things that I would want to say is when you're talking about the inability to retain your employees, I would want to know why. I would ask, do you do exit interviews and what exactly are those um, issues that they present that keeps them from maintaining that position? Have you also sent out surveys to people? What are some of the other ways that we can retain employees? I would like to see that. When you talk about um, the arts program, which I am completely in favor of, I would like to see what other options have been explored. There's a lot of grant money. Has, do you have someone that specializes in grants? Have some of those other avenues been explored? I just want more information on that other than just statistics. Here you go, we're wrapping it up and this is our decision. I would like specific information to say how is that intention, how is that wage increase going to retain employees? Is that guaranteed? Do we know that for sure? Is it going to have the effect we want? because it's a large effect on our people. And um, let me get back to the arts. I apologize for straying, but even though those are things that I value very much, we are in a position where inflation is difficult to manage for the best of households or those that are most secure. And I would argue just being realistic. Is this going to support the residents? Is this really something that the residents can maintain? Or can we look at other avenues? So anyway, I would really like to see some of those um, Thank you. things explored. Thanks. Thanks. And just for the for those that are watching, I don't know how many months have we been discussing the budget. Um, so we do have a ton of specificity for you. Um, buckle up. It's it's going to be a long ride for you, but um, the specificity is there. We've been going through it for weeks. We're happy to share it more with you as well. Okay. Um, Anyone else in the in the crowd? My name's Wilson Tolman. I lived in Ogden River on Washington. <clears throat> I appreciated what the lady just said. That uh, consider some other ways of spending more money. I'm on Paul. I'm on record as of opposing increasing money to this city for any reason, and I'm actively involved in taking them away. And for instance, one figure that we'd like is there's a proposal for an additional $400,000 for the RDA planning department. They disclosed that 
developers pay 13% of the planning costs, and Ogden City pays 87%. Those are just opposite of what it should be. And uh, they're increasing fees. They're going to talk about that in another item on the agenda. Also, uh, Ogden City has a geographical problem. And the way to sol solve that is to bring people in to the airport. And we heard in our last city council meeting from the Friends of Aviation that the Ogden City is mismanaging the airport by a, a bunch. And yet that's an asset that we can bring people in. Um, <clears throat> Orem, we compete with them. Orem brings 350 thousand people in for a 4th of July celebration. For our 24th, we maybe bring 100,000. We're not competing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tolman. Anyone else? Okay. If you guys are doing a good job of being polite and letting everybody take turns. If you need to, we can... <laughs> Create a line over in the aisle or something if you need to. But welcome, gentlemen. I've lived in Ogden now for over 40 years, and um, it's a good place to live. I'm sure you're all aware that there are a lot of people that do live here who are retired, and retired people don't get increases in their wages if they're, like most people, they're retired on fixed income. So the one thing that interests me is how efficiently we're using the funds that are being collected. And uh, it's, that's always hard to see. But um, as you all know, I'm sure you are aware that we are entering a period of time in which we're going to hit higher inflation. We are in effect in a war that's costing the United States government literally trillions of dollars. The U.S. government is trillions of dollars in debt and that's all going to fall back on us as taxes. And uh, the other thing I'm sure many of you are aware of, and the economists who are studying this problem, we are ready for a recession, and a big recession. And if that hits us, I'm curious to know how the city is going to handle a terrific reduction in ability to handle the kind of pay you're putting out. You know, it's going to hit everybody. And I don't, I don't hear anything about what we are planning to do in the event that we have a serious recession. And that could go on certainly for a year, maybe two years, maybe even longer. Uh, they're talking about something that could be throwbacks to the 1929. So I suggest that you take some serious consideration of those kind of conditions developing here, not only in Utah, but uh, in right here, good old Ogden City. And I think that has to be considered. Thank you for your time. Before you sit down, can you state your name for the record? Pardon? Oh, yes. My, my name is Paul Hoekstra, H-O-E-K-S-T-R-A. Thank you, Mr. Hoekstra, for addressing the men and our esteemed and duly elected women of the council. Thank you. Anyone else? I'm Joseph Bauman. I live at 1764 28th Street in Ogden. I've been born and raised here. I've been here my entire life. I'm a D baby. If any of you are old enough to know what that is. And I'll address the council as gentlemen and ladies. Thank you. You're welcome. I saw that. And um, anyway, my, I have a couple thoughts that inflation is, right now is about 8.9% thereabouts. And this uh, increase that you're looking for, 
on the property tax is roughly 13 point some odd percent. So you're going more than what the inflation rate is currently, but that's not to say what's gonna happen in 2023 when this takes effect and is put into play. So I'm, I'm looking at what the other gentleman just said about the uh, inflation and we're headed for a recession. I feel like we're in a recession right now. I see people go in the grocery store and some of them, I look at them and I think, how in the world can they even afford to buy what they're buying? When you look at them and the uh, children that they have, and Utah is a big children producing uh, state. And um, I think a, an equitable way for the pay increase for everyone and I've seen the top heavy <clears throat> entities that have huge payroll uh, for the top people in their different organizations. And I think that uh, an equitable way to do the payroll increase would be not to just blanket out a 13 or 14 percent increase, but look at that total value that you would gain for an increase to give the different people and, and have a corporal or a lieutenant make the same amount of increase dollar wise instead of being a 14 percent if you take the mayor's salary that he's going to get a uh, roughly a 20 some odd or thirty thousand dollar pay increase instead of doing that uh, for those upper echelon people that they're going to make that much more money take and pay them like a $2 an hour or $3 an hour, or whatever that dollar amount is that you have in excess that's gonna be able to afford everybody that pay increase. That way a corporal will see the same type of pay increase per dollar on their paycheck versus the captain of the police department. So that the 40 hour a week that they work, they're gonna see that same increase. So. They don't feel like they're slighted because they're lower skilled people. And I think that you, you need good management, you need good leaders to lead the city and, and the different organizations. I just think that that'd be a little bit more equitable way to do that. And then on a side note, with the tax increase on our property, I don't even receive Weber Basin water, but yet it's on my uh, tax notice that I pay that amount. So I think that with all of the other entities uh, that are raising their rates, and I'm on three different boards and I know how hard it is. I'm a chairman of one of them and it's extremely difficult to do the pay rate, but if you don't do it and raise the taxes that you're gonna take in, uh, you can't do infrastructure or you don't have quality employees to do the work for you. Thank so you. I think that on that aspect of it, it'd be worthwhile to look at giving everybody an equal, equitable amount of pay increase. Thank you. And not just the upper, upper echelon people with a bigger dollar amount. Thank you. Thank you. For everyone who plans to speak, please be mindful of the time. I, it's one of my rules. I try not to be a jerk. I usually use a different word, but I won't tonight. So don't make me be a jerk and cut everybody off. Just please be mindful of the clock. Thanks. Go ahead, state your name. My name's Bob Weston and I've lived in the city all my life. I had a uh, occasion two weeks ago to have a washer repaired by a repairman that had taken over a business from a man that had retired. In the course of his repairing that washing machine, he told me, he says, Ogden City, he drove me out of the city. He says, I know of 40 other businesses that have been driven out of the city by Ogden City. That's not acceptable. You should uh, give all the statistics here about our taxes. I've lived in my house. In fact, I was, my mother was living there when I was born because my dad was in the service. So I've lived in that house all my life other than the time when I would had to find an apartment when I first got married. Other than that, I bought the house from the estate when my grandfather died. So that means I've been here a long time. Right now, my taxes are costing me twice what my house payment was when I bought my home. And my income is on a fixed income because I'm on a social security. I got a social security raise, I think it was two years ago, of $2. Now that $2 within two weeks 
was gone because they raised the price of my insurance exactly that amount. And you want to take more of my tax money and the money that I am getting. You say that our taxes are lower. Okay, maybe they are lower. Last year, it cost me $500 more than it did the year before. The year before, it cost me another $500 more than it did the year before that. This is not acceptable with people, and there are a bunch of us that are on fixed income. Now, either you guys tighten your budget, or something's going to happen that you're not going to like. You're elected officials, and elected officials, as far as all the way from the mayor, and city council, all the rest of them, come in on an elected vote knowing what uh, wages were. And yet you want to take more money out of the people that can't afford his pockets. I uh, admire these guys in blue for sticking around because I know that when I was working, I went looking for work, uh, places that would pay me more money so I could afford to feed my family. And now I haven't got that opportunity. And if I was one of them, I would find someplace else to work or find a different trade. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Taylor Knuth, uh, Ogden City resident. I first want to start by thanking the council, um, and I specifically want to thank the communications efforts of your team to get this information out there. Um, this is a very impressive showing, it almost rivals chickens. Um, <laughs> I want to be sensitive to what I'm about to say, not to invalidate any of the other perspectives that have been presented to you today, but nevertheless, I think I bring a new perspective to be told. Um, before I say what I'm about to say, I want to emphasize that the years of stagnant wages and under market um, wages for our employees only apply to certain uh, employees, not the highest paid of the employees in the city. Um, but nevertheless, I want to emphasize that I'm one of the few people that chose Ogden. I came to Ogden in 2011 on a scholarship to attend Weber State University. I made $8 an hour at Weber State working for their performing arts building. I struggled to make ends meet. I lived in a townhouse behind the Little Caesars on Harrison. Every Monday I would buy a pizza and that's what I ate for the week. Um, so I understand struggle, but um, in choosing Ogden, um, it means a lot to me. I met my husband here. I've built my family here. I uh, own two homes in Ogden now. Um, and I want to um, talk a little bit about that. I, um, bought my first home from Ogden City after renting in Ogden for quite a while, and I bought it from the city for about $220,000. A few years later, I sold it for about two ninety. dollars That same home just sold last year for a little under $500,000. I bought that home in 2014. Um, it's almost double in less than 10 years. Um, I want to also emphasize that I'm a, I'm a public service junkie. I've worked in nonprofits for over 10 years. Um, I love public service. Um, but the wages in Ogden are just quite, quite literally uh, pitiful. Um, I uh, took a job at the beginning of COVID, um, and I got a 28% increase in my wages um, by working outside of the city. And I'm part of that wave of young millennials, young professionals who want to live, work, and play in Ogden. Um, but because of the lack of attention to the wages of this city, we're not able to do that. My husband, Sean, 50% increase when he went from working in Ogden to working in Salt Lake. So all that to say, I believe that this body has a fiduciary responsibility to ensure that the employees of this city are taken care of. Um, and, and that means um, passing this budget and including uh, the raise that is necessary to get our employees to market rate. Um, I don't think all employees, like I mentioned earlier, I think it's a subset of the employees that need this raise. Um, but that is what I have to say, and thank you for your time. Thanks, Taylor. Thank you for your time. My name is Tyler Kunzler. I'm a lifelong resident of Ogden, a teacher and property owner. I just want to start by sharing uh, quickly, I know the property taxes haven't come out, but you, it is accessible online through Weaver County Parcel Search. I also, uh, very similar to Ms. Smith, did a calculation on the inc percent increase in property taxes. I also did the council, but not as close to your figures because a couple were not available. 
The one figure she didn't share though, is even though the value of the properties is uh, in the 30% range, uh, my calculation was just under that. The, the statistic that wasn't shared is the percent increase that's being paid to Weber County for property taxes. That increase in taxes is 24.7%. So if I pay $100,000 in taxes, this year I'm paying $124,700. Now, I understand the calculations that not all of that, I would look at it as across the board. If 55% goes to the school district and a certain percent goes, I think what you're saying is that 24.5% uh, does not go to Ogden City, but it does go out of a person's pocket to pay property taxes. So the thing you have to consider when you look at an increase in that size, that's why you have rent increases like the uh, first individual stated. The, yeah, rent's gonna go up $200 a month, not to, to benefit a property owner, but to pay the increase in property taxes. Uh, something should be done in how property values are calculated in Ogden City. Uh, one council member, their home was valued last year at 363,000, this year at $527,000. That's a $164,000 increase in one year. <clears throat> that shouldn't happen. There should be an appropriate evaluation for a property and an appropriate evaluation of the tax rate. So you can, some will say, well, property values are always lower. Well, you just have a higher tax rate. It should be fairly valued with a fairly valued tax rate. So when adjustment comes, it's not that kind of a hit. I would just also state, Ogden City, you're touting that there are lower increase in tax rates, but millions of dollars are taken out of the utility fund. <clears throat> that people pay for water bills that is then transferred to the budget. I don't think that that's appropriate or should happen. If somebody's paying utility uh, money for utilities, that should stay in a utility, not transferred to a general, general fund because then it looks like you're collecting, you have a lower tax rate, but the money is coming from other sources. I would just say you do need to consider 24.5% is three times roughly the rate of inflation. And that hits everybody across the board. And the consequences of that reverberate throughout everything that we do. I would just say, I understand that everybody needs more, but the cycle has got to be looked at in terms of how we're addressing, addressing fair property values with the taxes coming in. Because regardless, it's 24.5% more that's going somewhere. Thank, Thank you. you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Kunzler. Welcome. Thank you. Got to adjust this a little taller than most here. Uh, hi, my name is Alex Sanders. Um, I'm the president of the Professional Firefighters of Utah Local 552. That's here in Ogden. Uh, first, let me just say thanks to all of you for considering this uh, proposal. It means a lot to us. It means a lot to our employees. Um, I'll try to stick to just talking about them and, and nothing personal. Uh, I want to rep I represent not about 90% of our department, all of which are uh, operations employees. Um, and what this means to these employees is uh, difficult to put in words. Um, but what I can say <clears throat> is that we're, hem we're currently hemorrhaging uh, qualified employees. Um, uh, a lot of our employees who are tenured, 10 to 15 year paramedics, are leaving for uh, places that can pay them a higher wage um, and give them a lower workload. Um, and that is um, to the detriment of our citizens. Um, our citizens are the ones who most benefit from qualified personnel. Um, and without a livable wage, we're incapable of providing that service to them. Um, God forbid anybody should have to call 911. Um, they expect the, the best, the brightest, um, and, and quite frankly, it doesn't matter to them what they're paid in that moment. Um, they just want their problem solved. Um, so to that point, um, it's difficult when um, we're, not, we're no longer providing a quality service because we don't have tenured employees to do so. Um, I think in order to retain employees, uh, we, need, we need better um, wages, first and foremost. And then the thing that could help us uh, retain the employees uh, second after that, that would be most important, would be a lower workload, which means more firefighters. Um, just for a frame of reference, Salt Lake City runs 30,000 calls in a year. They have 300, over 300 firefighters and um, 15 fire stations. We ran 22,000 calls 
22,000 in a year um, with five stations and just over 100. So we have a third of the workforce and uh, run nearly as many calls. So um, like, I, like I said earlier, that's, that's to the detriment of our citizens. Um, so this budget, um, this budget proposal not only benefits the employees of the city, um, but also it benefits the citizens of the city. I think it's, um, should this go through, it's a win-win. And I don't know that everybody sees that, but um, should they ever have to call 911, um, I, I would hope that the person who shows up at their doorstep is qualified. Uh, we don't want people who, uh, we don't want new people training new people. And I think we're starting to reach that. Um, so we want to keep those employees, and I think that this is the first and best thing that's going to help this, this proposed budget. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alex. This is intimidating. I know how Janine felt. <laughs> so I'm Trudy Simpson. I am an Ogden City employee. A couple of weeks ago, I was watching one of the work sessions when I believe Mark Johnson referenced something Council Member Blair said. The price of gas will go down, but the box of cereal is not going to. The proposed increase or COLA will help offset the price of that box of cereal and the other rising costs that will not go down. For me, who has a family of five, it will make it so my grocery bill, that has almost doubled, isn't quite as hard financially. I have read several posts and comments on the community Facebook pages regarding the proposed tax increase in COLA. Several people have stated increased fire, police, and those crews that go out in the middle of the night and trim staff so a tax increase isn't necessary. I agree, these jobs are important and a necessity, but without fleet employees, patrol cars, fire engines, water and sewer trucks, and equipment would not be running. Without facility employees, buildings would not be maintained. Without human resources and risk management, those employees would not be paid, benefits would not be administered, employee injuries would not be handled, and recru recruitment would not be done. Without, without recreation employees, kids would not have sports to participate in. These are just a few examples of what a couple other divisions do and how they are also a necessity. If the proposed increase doesn't pass, I'm afraid we will lose great employees to other cities or the private sector because even though someone loves their job and they have great coworkers, providing for your family is most important and is a priority. All employees matter and everyone deserves and will appreciate this COLA. At the end of the day, it takes all of us to make sure things run smoothly. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thanks for your patience. Um, my name is Joshua Brooks. Um, Miss Janine, I apologize. I was late. I was in that overtime crunch trying to take care of the family. But for those of you who aren't clearly familiar with Ogden, we have different boroughs, different avenues, different additions that come across the years. Myself, I'm a transplant to the state. I'm from Island Falls, Maine. My family was stationed at Hill back in the 90s. We chose to move our family here back in 2010. We bought our home from the city for $32,500. Our property tax at that point was at $500. I briefly glanced over some of the increased proposals and, and some other things today between meetings at work. I saw that we're proposing for an increase in the sales tax to help bring up the revenue budget. I saw that we're proposing the increase of property taxes. I know everyone needs an increase in salary. It's very obvious we're all coming out of the pandemic. Everyone is shortfalling. Our incomes are dropping. Our cost of living is skyrocketing. I ran the, the quick tax link that was on the webpage this morning. My property tax when I bought my home was $500. My home is 739 square feet. If this goes through, my property tax is $2,584 for the year. Again, I live in the Bowers edition. For those of you who aren't real clear on that, that's the Jefferson Park neighborhood down off of Washington Boulevard. I've met many of you there as we've done the community meetings with the outreach and things going on in that neighborhood to clean it up. And there have been substantial changes that have happened down there and it's been great. But I agree, we do need to increase in areas. We need to, to raise the pay for the people that matter. But some of these things are ridiculous. I looked at it and the average property taxes valued or the average home value across the city of Ogden is $410,000 is what the assessment was ran at. My dirt hasn't changed since I bought my home. We barely afforded a new roof for it. I don't think that we will be able to stay living in our home here in Utah where we chose to bring our family to if this passes. So just consider that for those people that are already living close to that federal poverty level. 
because this room seems to be full of them. So thank you for your time. Thanks, Mr. Brooks. Ginger Myers, I've been a resident since 2007. Uh, thank you so much uh, for even acknowledging the budget proposal and I hope you take into account the words of um, some of the employees and those that have voiced in support of that. Um, this city I have seen since 2007 really just grow. I think our, uh, our parks have just flourished. The trails have just, they're off the charts. People move here from California, from everywhere, because that's why they come here. Our water is great. Streets are constantly being repaired, even though we complain about the construction. Our kids have amazing recreation to participate in. Our seniors have a wonderful place to go to at Golden Hours. And the city has invested in all of those things. And the city works. And it works for lots of reasons, but mainly because of the men and women in this room. It works because we work. And I just want you to know that we appreciate your consideration. We love this city. We work hard. We want to continue working hard and give back to the residents and to our community that deserves that. Thank you. Thank you, Ginger. Ginger's not only a neighbor, she's a hero. Thanks for saving a man's life by bringing all of your heart to your work at Ogden City. Thanks. Sorry, next. My name is David Carlson. Um, I got a place out of the Ogden Airport. Last time we talked, we talked about Gary Williams telling you guys just basically mistruce. No one rebuttaled that. Ben Nagoski, you looked at me or looked at the camera and said, yeah, the airport thing's hard. Have you lost $120,000 out of your retirement? It doesn't matter. Your signature's right here, so your signature means nothing. Gary Williams' signature means absolutely nothing. Now, these people are sitting here saying, hey, taxes and we have a problem with the budget. I get it. So maybe everybody should au demand that that Ogden Airport be audited. It needs to be audited. There is money missing. There's money that's been misappropriated. And right now, they're deciding to take and crush 54 hangers out there. That's guaranteed income that comes into Ogden City. They're, you're telling these people they're going to raise their taxes. 54 hangers, that's approximately 54,000 extra dollars so that we can build new hangars with your money. So you guys should demand auditing this Ogden Airport, okay? That's just it. This lease means something. It's signed by Ogden City. Most of you have been raised in the church or a church. There's something called the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not covet. Honor this contract. Let me give you my money. You're crushing my business of 18 years. I collect sales tax. I collect sales tax on my labor. I collect sales tax on my parts. I give it to Ogden. I'm happy to do it. My Ogden rates went up 225%. And they're not going to honor this contract by renewing my lease. And several other people, that's people that do have money, not these older people that do are in fixed incomes. We have that money. We want to give it to the city. But... The airport manager that's right behind me wants to take these hangers from us that are our hangers on your land. You've increased those land leases 125% this year, and most people were happy to pay it. We want to give you money, but you won't take it from us. Basically, I was told they're going to bulldoze my hangar as soon as possible. For what? Another parking lot that's already empty? How much money have you guys spent there? I've already asked that question. How much money have you spent? How much money have you lost? And now you're going to turn around and take it off the backs of these people who live in Ogden. Guess what? I'll put my business in Roy, and I'll collect my sales tax for Roy. Okay, that's what's going to happen. I built my business for that airport for your airlines. I built it specifically for that. And even before those airlines left, I was told, get out of here. Take your hangar and leave. Your signature means nothing, Mark. Neither does Gary Williams, because it's right here. Have a nice day. Anybody else care to address the council? 
If you could make sure you put the mic real close to your money maker, so everybody on the sure thing in the audience. I got a hear. loud voice anyway, so right on. Thanks, Thanks Carrie. Uh, my name is Ashley Phillips. Uh, I am an Ogden City firefighter. I've been working with Ogden City for the past 18 years. Um, I'd like to extend uh, an appreciation to you for this consideration uh, of the uh, wage increase for fire personnel, police, and also the other employees. Uh, for the, I can only speak for myself, so I speak for um, just my own experiences. But when I hired Han here originally back in 2004, um, it was a career, it was a great opportunity for me and my family to um, grow and to start uh, my path into creating a family and a career for the rest of my life. Uh, for the next 10 years, I ended up uh, stifled uh, because of different reasons, but I ended up making roughly the same amount of uh, money that a day one employee at the fire department would come in and make. So at 10 years, I was making the same wage. So um, I come from a long legacy of my great grandfather, my grandfather and my great uncle also all were all firefighters here for Ogden City. It's a legacy that I wanted to carry on. And I have stuck through with Ogden City and I care for the city. I have responded to many houses in this whole entire uh, city for the last 18 years. And so it, I am Ogden, it is part of me and I love Ogden to death. Um, this pay increase means a big deal for my family where it, it gives me the opportunity to uh, provide for my children in ways like um, I don't have to work overtime every year to be able to um, accomplish our goals and to pay off uh, certain things or just even buy groceries um, because I was stifled for all those years and then as, as now I feel the inflation as everybody else. Um, and it gives me the opportunity to be home with my children because now I do not have to work that overtime. I miss a lot of Christmases. I miss a lot of Thanksgivings. I miss, I miss a lot of holidays as it is, but that's even extended more when I have to now work overtime to be able to just live. So this implementation or this um, consideration for a wage increase, not just uh, is um, to buy things, it's to help me live, it's to help me be a father, be part of my family, and to be home with them. Uh, because now I don't have to work all those extra hours and or a second job besides having a career, because that's what I've done for the last 18 years. And so hopefully this, with this, I'll be able to um, minimize that and now become a better father or a better person with my own family. And I appreciate that, thank you. Officer Austin Eborn with the Ogden City Police Department. Uh, as some people were uh, coming up here, I really wasn't planning on saying anything. I just wanted to mention a couple of things. Um, many of the officers behind me here, uh, they are some very distinguished and respectable people, and they all have several years on. I think as I looked around, I'm pretty sure I'm the uh, newest officer here, at least in this room, and uh, some things that I've discussed with other officers uh, that are about my level. Uh, I'm about to hit my two year mark here in Ogden as an officer. Uh, when I first, I actually graduated the police academy and got married in the same weekend. And uh, that was stressful, but uh, as we tried to move out this way, we found out that not only could we not live anywhere in Ogden, but I, we couldn't even aff afford anywhere in Weaver County. Uh, this, the closest place that we could afford for my family was in Tremont. And so I choose to make that drive to Ogden every day because I love working here. Um, but the main thing that I wanted to discuss was that um, <laughs> externally, Ogden Police Department, uh, we have a reputation as a very hardworking and very uh, busy police department. Uh, some approximate stats, uh, me as a two-year officer, I've handled um, more calls in Ogden City than many municipal city police departments will handle, police officers will have, handle in five to 10 years of uh, service. And uh, that's just purely because of how busy the police department is here based on per officer per um, calls for service that we have in the city. Um, what I kept thinking about as people make certain comments is that also externally, along with that, Ogden Police is known as a stepping stone agency, or at least it was when I got into this. I came from the sheriff's office two years ago. I was a correctional officer and I decided I wanted to be a law enforcement officer on the road. And uh, my plan as I did that, as I found those statistics was that I was going to come to Ogden City, 
be trained as a very high functioning, highly skilled, um, very experienced officer and work here for whatever years it took me to get there. And then I was going to move on. I was going to go somewhere where, as they've said before, um, we are not somewhere that would not be as busy, somewhere where that would not be as uh, low paid. And I would use that as an opportunity to get that experience and move on. Since then, I, I came in at a very fortunate time. We got some uh, very good things, not only in pay, but uh, Chief Young has increased a lot of benefits that we have at the police department. Um, but due to the last year's jump and what we're proposing right now, I've completely flipped on that. Uh, if we continue to support not only our officers, the, the fire department, and the people that do support us, uh, we will, I don't plan on leaving ever because I love this city. But at the end of the day, I do have to feed my family as well. Thanks, Officer Hemorn. Kim? Um, Kim Boucher, I am a resident here in Ogden, like Taylor um, chose Ogden. Um, I wasn't born here and moved here about 10 years ago. I own two businesses, started two businesses within the city in the last 10 years, and I run a nonprofit downtown. Um, no one wants to be in your position. Um, no one wants to run on this as a campaign of let's raise taxes or let's um, add fees and this and that. Um, in the 10 years that I've lived here, I've been consistently baffled and shocked at the things that we don't charge for as a city. Um, free recycling is something that I've come to this table and said, why? I don't understand that. Um, the amount of services provided to my children, I have two boys um, that have done every Parks and Rec program within the city through Marshall White, through um, uh, Ogden Soccer and, and everything beyond. Um, the fees are a joke. They, they're, I don't know how you accomplish anything when you charge someone $12 for a six week program, give them a soccer ball, t-shirt, whistle, the glove for playing um, in baseball, brand new bat. Those are incredible things that are offered. And um, someone earlier said, as residents, I don't think you realize what you have. Um, there's been such an um, expectation of things being provided and consistently provided at no cost and, and no additional fees for so long. And you, you know, Janine, I thought your presentation was really remarkable um, in demonstrating um, just all of the things that are, you know, we're, we're leaning a lot into what um, payroll and wages are, but the city services in general, there is so much that is provided to residents and all of those things cost more money as people use things more. And um, something that I think is incredibly complex and confusing, how long it took you just to present this one piece of the puzzle. Um, someone mentioned sales tax increases. I think really digging into where sales tax comes from and where it goes, how much of our Ogden City resident base is shopping in places that do not benefit this town. I'd venture to guess that of the people in this room, probably 75% of your sales tax spent in, an, in a year probably goes to Riverdale. Um, Riverdale is not doing anything for you as residents. And so making those decisions, I think all of us, you know, there, it's easy um, to run on a platform where you're like, we're going to keep fees low, we're not going to raise taxes. This is a really hard and not fun conversation. And I don't envy the seats that any of you are sitting in. But I do think that you guys have done an incredible job in explaining um, in your in your outreach and your um, education on things. But I would love to see that education expanding to, to Weber County and to the state level so that you can bring more awareness to not just how this city functions, but how the other pieces, um, people are, are telling you how much they're spending out of pocket. Um, and maybe this, this um, show of support can go to some of those other agencies as well, because it is layered and complex. And I just appreciate the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Welcome. Dennis Kalwerski. Um, I just wanted to make a, a quick comment. The individual that spoke about the airport, he is 100% right in what he's saying. You've had hangers out there that were producing income, thousands of dollars, from property tax, from lease payments, uh, businesses out there that have left because they, they can no longer uh, operate under the restrictions that's been placed on them. How can, how can, I know you're looking for money, but 
how can you drive money away? When we bought the hangers out there, we were paying taxes based on the on a higher property value. Now the hangers have been devalued. We're we're paying almost nothing for for uh, property tax anymore. You've lost all that money. You go in and you destroy somebody's hanger. You take their personal property from them. You destroy it. You've lost that income. It's not coming in anymore. And so I I just want to say you know he was absolutely right and. I don't know what you need to do to correct it, but it's it's wrong the way it's being done now. So, thank you. Thanks, sir. You're up, Monty. Like it or not, it's your turn. I was really hoping somebody else would. I know, I know. could tell. Um, Monty Stewart, uh, I work in the Public Services uh, Department. So, thank thank you, everyone. Uh, I just w wanted really to say thank you. Um, it's a tough job you guys are in. Um, my father was a city councilman in a small town. It was horrible, really. My mom begged him to never run again, you know. And so I, 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 I have a little insight into what you guys are up against. And uh, somebody, I forget who, who it was, they, they said, you're going to make, no matter what your decision is, you're going to make people mad. Right, there will be unhappy people and there will be some happy people. But we really appreciate um, all the hard work and thought that you've put into this. Um, I just, I'm gonna not go, I'm, I'm not gonna go over three minutes, I'm gonna be quick. I just, um, there are a lot of people in here, I really felt kind of emotional and I'm, I am a little emotional. But there's a lot of people in here that um, they want to serve um, the people. And right now we do, somebody said hemorrhaging. They, they said that word. Sometimes it feels like that um, too often. Um, and it's been very difficult for us to retain employees. Um, you, you, when, when you put out, uh, when you open a job and you have two openings and you get two people to show for the interview and, and then they both turn it down and, and kind of laugh at what you're offering, it's frustrating and it, it's hard to get uh, to serve the, the, the citizens of Ogden and make things nice for them. Um, it, it's difficult. Um, and then I, I would say that uh, many people, I, I'm looking around, work way too much um, because of this. The working too much to get things done um, at the cost of family life. Um, we want to be uh, a place known that that we have a good work-life balance and and we, we need to f do what we can to fix it. And I'm gonna leave it at that. So th thank you again. Monty, thank you. You are one of the most sincere people that works here, so thank you. Hello, hello. Hello, welcome. I echo that sentiment in terms of appreciating you and, all, and the work you do and the sacrifices you make to make these tough decisions. I'm here didn't even intend to speak, but I have not heard my opinion expressed, which I want to share. And that is that this is not a question of whether to support our officers or not. I think we're all supportive of that and feel that they should be appropriately compensated for what we do. We absolutely need our law enforcement and public service officers. But it's a question of how much and who. And this budget is not just about law enforcement. It's about a 14%, 13% raise across the board. Uh, I very much support the council and those who have opted out of this raise. Thank you for doing that. I think that's appropriate. Uh, honestly, you have a conflict of interest. You're aware of that in raising your own salary. So I, I hope you're sensitive to that. But there are a lot of other parts of this budget that have not been addressed today. Are those places that we might be able to adjust our expectations and bring the budget down into a realistic figure for the benefit of Ogden residents? I also want you to understand, I think some of you know I'm an attorney, and I've been working in Ogden for the last 20 years representing a lot of low-income families. I have not raised my fees in 20 years. Not because I'm not exposed to inflation, not because my housing has not gone up, my cost of living absolutely has gone up, but the reason I haven't increased my fees is because the market will not bear it. And I'd like you to think about that in terms of this, this tax increase. 
that the market will not bear it. And when you, there's a, a, a balance point, a tipping point, when you're raising taxes to the point that people cannot pay it, they're going to walk with their feet. They're going to vote with their feet. They're going to leave Ogden and Weber County. I can't tell you exactly where that tipping point is, but we're close to it. Because I feel the tension in this room. I felt the tension online when you know this announcement came out. People are really upset because they're squeezed to the limit right now. So I respect what you do. It's a difficult call. But there, nobody, when they send out their wish list, gets everything they ask for. And I know there's probably been a lot of pairing going on to even get to this point. Can you tighten it a little bit further for us? Can you help us with our bottom line, which is really, we're stretched to the limit right now. So thank you so much for all you do, and I hope you'll take that into consideration. Thanks. Before you go, I yeah. don't think you stated your name for the record. Lorraine Brown. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think we're getting close in the room. We've got a number of commenters online, but we'll make sure we get to everybody in the room before we get to those folks. Come on up, bud. Hello. Hello. I want to thank y'all for what you do. You know, up here in front of everybody weekly, you know, you get voted in here. So I completely understand it's hard. But my name's Jason O'Brien. I work for sewer department. You know, there's not a lot of people out there that want to do the job I do. It takes a special kind of person to go out there and do what we do. And, you know, we have, I've been with the city for 13 years. I started as a temp and did two years up at parks. And then I went seasonal for streets for a year. It was hard to get a full-time job when I started here. Now, we can't keep people. I see people in and out the door weekly. You got, you got a new guy coming in, new guy going out, if not two or three. You know, it's, I, I understand that the residents don't want to pay the extra money, but if they don't pay the extra money, you, you guys are gonna lose a lot more employees. So we've had an open position now for three, four weeks, and it's open, it's closed, it's open, it's closed because we get one, maybe two applicants, and they're, they can't even interview them because they don't qualify for it. So I, I would like to say on behalf of operations, that this pay raise, if it goes through, it would benefit and probably attract more people to come in and work and want to work for Ogden City. I mean, I, I get tired of, you know, have to take standby every three, four weeks or whatever because we don't have a full rotation. And that's more money out of the taxpayer's pocket, you know, because they're paying us people that's been here longer, more money than our new people that come in. And I mean, it, it benefits everybody in the long run just to do it and get it over with. And hopefully we can get it all done and the taxpayers will appreciate what we do for them. Considering I know they don't see a lot of the work that we do do for them. Thanks. Good evening, Angel Castillo, Ogden resident. Um, this is a really tough conversation, so let's let's start out with things that feel good. First and foremost, I would uh, again like to shout out to Brandon Garside and the council for making sure that these meetings are available online. I was able to listen uh, from what I was doing today, and I serve on the Utah Multicultural Affairs ARP ESSER committee and. Abby Cox had a raise up, uh, had a show up for teachers event today. And I was able to engage and listen to the work session and follow along and all the way up until here. So I really appreciate that uh, step towards accessibility. And this is a tough conversation. And I'd like to piggyback Officer Thomas's comment that this does give you a little taste of what it's like to be a police officer. It's a tough decision. It's a tough call. There are winners and losers and you just try to make the best decision you can for the person and the environment and the situation in front of you. And, you know, um, the first time I ever stood before you in public comment was in support of OPD. And I, if, if you'll, you'll get used to this as, as the newer member, um, at least every quarter I showed up here since 2018 asking for more money for OPD. I understand law enforcement. 
I've been through the Citizens Academy. My father is a police officer. And public safety is the number one thing followed by utilities that a city is supposed to be delivering. And when your officers have a problem that they can't possibly keep staff, that they can't make calls that they want to, and then, of course, do the kind of policing that everybody wants, where someone's walking around and you know your officer's name because it's your beat. You see him or her every single day. That's the kind of policing that people want, but we just don't have enough. And I have been asking you to fund OPD since 2018, and you had to wait for a study, and you couldn't just look at the data, and, and that's that hurts because all the people out here have been making comments about how expensive things are and how it's hard to live here. And so you've got a lot of tough choices before you. And I say prioritize public safety. And I also understand that you're bound as government to make a raise unilaterally. You cannot segregate employees without radically changing salary classifications. I get that. And so while I am not a fan of higher salaries getting more money, I am a fan of people who are just trying to get by and put bread on their table and serve the city and protect you and make sure your utilities work and all your paperwork happens. I want those people not to worry. I want our seniors to not have to worry about taxes. And I strongly encourage you to look at other cities and states that freeze senior taxes until the home is sold and then it's accelerated to current rate for the seller. Thank you. Thank you. OK, anybody else in the chambers? I see a lot of people standing up, but I think you're just trying to give some part of yourself a break. So OK, if there's no one else in the room, we'll go online. One Tim David. I think that's David Timmerman. Can you hear us? Yes, yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Hang on a minute. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Can you hear us? No. Uh-oh. I think I lost you. We can hear you. Can you hear us? You can hear me, but I can't hear you. Okay. We'll give, we'll give our technical folks of the moment. How about now, David, can you hear us now? Okay. I think that's a no. If you can hear me, I'd try to carry on, but apparently you cannot. Do you want to try? Hello? Do you want to try Heath Sato and then come back to? Well, hopefully you can hear me. I can't hear myself. Um, if I can fix that. Okay. Um, so anyway, I hope you can hear me. Um, I just wanted to comment on one thing. First of all, um, I I understand the need for an increase. I understand uh, everything that Janine shared with us. Uh, my concern has to do with a little quip that she made that uh, that the mayor's taxes were going up too. Um, I wasn't amused simply because he's also going to accept an increase of about 30% um, of his salary. So um, I, I didn't think that was appropriate. But regardless, when I see the kind of salaries that the mayor and the CAO are getting, um, sometimes I wonder why we need both a manager and a mayor. And, and those are my thoughts and concerns. I know that a, a study was done uh, prior to the suggested increases. Um, I do agree with the other comments that have met, been made tonight that, um, that uh, perhaps we need to focus on the um, lower level, level salaries and adjust the upper top salaries. Um, and I agree with that. I don't know. I know there's been a lot of study and this is needed, but it does hurt. Um, like many who have commented, I'm retired and uh, my wife is too. And so we don't have the increased uh, pay that we used to get. But uh, I would like to see that and I would like to, uh, 
to ask the mayor to recuse himself if he hasn't already for this large increase. Thank you for your consideration. Again, David Timmerman, and I live in Ogden City. Thank you, David. If you can hear me, maybe Brandon, there's a, I see a chat feature. Maybe you could just let him know that we heard his comments and appreciate it. And let's hope the next one goes better. Heath Sato. Hi, Heath Sato, Ogden resident. Um, I don't envy your job at all tonight. So thank you for being here and, and facing the fire. I know it's not easy. Um, for those with uh, retired incomes that have stepped up tonight, uh, Angel Castillo, who just spoke to you, has been talking about an intelligent way to address that issue for years now. And I hope the administration will give our ideas a closer look. I uh, think you all have heard tonight how housing costs are significantly driving down people's take home pay after paying their bills. And that's one reason why our city employees need more pay. And that's great if we can pay them properly, but also please consider that all of us pay those salaries through taxes. So I'd like to hear more or really any discussion about how we are going about raising wages for everyone else. The mayor likes to point out uh, wages and ratings based on data for the Ogden Clearfield metropolitan area, <clears throat> but that's, uh, that's not Ogden. That's a much bigger area with higher wages. Wages in Ogden proper have been pretty stagnant over the last decade in general. Let's hear more talk about how we can bring higher wages to the employed cities, citizens of Ogden in addition to the city employees. Lastly, we need to play less fast and loose with the budget. Our city budget is nearly twice that per capita of many comparable cities, and I've seen little dissent over significant budget increases. And we all know it's not because our sidewalks are smooth and the potholes are patched. Another way to be smarter with our city money is small changes like policy updates. In the work session today, I was so glad you appear to be finally heeding my call to create more accountability in our RDA process after the significant failures I pointed out a year and a half ago. But by the end of that short discussion and work session today, I'm realizing that it needs to be said that we don't have to reinvent the wheel. This isn't really that hard. Lots of cities have far more transparent and equitable RDA systems for selecting developers for projects and hopefully get better outcomes for our money. Regardless, it took too long in my opinion. I'm glad to see the first step towards hopefully meaningful change. And thank you for that. I think everyone here tonight though should know that all but one person on the council just recently voted to give one high level city employee a golden parachute if they ever are fired for virtually any reason. A golden parachute was about four years of an Ogden police officer's salary just for being fired. <laughs> and, a, and for an employee that doesn't even live in Ogden. So I know you have your reasons, but it's that sort of waste that we need to stop rubber stamping so readily. Thank you. Thank you, Heath. Diana Lopez. <laughs> Go ahead, Diana. Hey, everyone. Hi. Um, I hope you guys can hear me. So I, I'm unfortunately not able to be um, in city council chambers today, but my name is Diana Lopez and I'm the community outreach coordinator with the Ogden Police Department. Um, I love working for Ogden City. If you would have told me I was gonna work for the department years ago, I don't know that I would have believed you. Um, a lot of people probably aren't aware, but um, Ogden Police is the only one in, in the state that actually has a position like mine and not just because I'm in it, but I think there's a lot of value in being able to do some outreach and help represent some of the marginalized communities within Ogden City. Um, and prior to me having my twins, um, because of some of the stagnant wages, and we've been pretty fortunate with the police department, but I was actually thinking about looking into um, going into a different city um, to be able to make more money. Um, because I had my twins and because Ogden City is so fantastic to work for, I've been able to stay with the department. Um, the department has been so great to be able to work around family issues. And I think that's one of the things that Ogden City does really well. Now, if we can keep our wages competitive, I think it definitely keeps us as employees more engaged and more willing to give more to the city and to the residents that deserve it. 
So I, I know there's a lot of mixed feelings in the room and I completely sympathize because I lived in Ogden most of my life. 90% of my family still lives in Ogden, including my in-laws. And, and I know it's a burden on everybody. Um, but I really appreciate the fact that the city, city council and the mayor in our different departments are really trying to take care of us as employees. So thank you. Thanks, Diana. Sounds like you got your hands full in the background. So thanks for tuning in. Okay, we've got a number of people still attending online. I don't see any more hands raised. Is there anyone else in the public that cares to address the council? Okay, seeing no more movement, I'll entertain a motion. Mr. Chair, seeing no more interest in public comment, I would uh, make a motion that we close the public hearing for this item. I'll, well, it's, it's going to go on again in a couple. Uh, oh, that's two, right. Two, we're not going to close it. We're going uh, to continue, continue it. Continue it to continue August 2nd. Continue it to August 2nd. There we go. Second. We have a motion by Council Member Heyer, second by Council Member Blair to continue the public hearing to August 2nd. Uh, this is a voice vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so we have uh, heard a lot of feedback tonight. Um, certainly reflects a lot of the feedback we've heard before tonight as well. Any any comments or questions from council members? Just quickly, I would just like to thank everyone for coming and for that feedback. That's why we did this, to have it two nights. It, it always seemed... Uh, counterintuitive to put something on the agenda, get tons of feedback like that, and then still vote on it that same night. Um, it is great to get the input. It is great to hear the thoughts and the feelings of our residents and then have time to, to mull that over and to think about it and to, and to assess that information. So I, I appreciate everyone being here tonight. I encourage people to come August 2nd, but I, I do think this was a, a much better approach to have it on, on, two, on two separate nights. So I appreciate that, the effort that went into that. It, it did feel insincere mm -hmm. to take comment and then make a take action right away. Yeah. Knowing we, we really couldn't do much. The feedback we heard is significant. Yep. It's going to take a lot of work for us to address the feedback we heard. So I'm glad we do have more time before we hear from folks again. Chair, I, I thought it was noteworthy that we had this many people uh, here to give uh, input. Um, somebody used to comment at rivals chickens <laughs> and uh, you know, if, you talk about people's animals, you get this kind of a thing. You talk about the budget, sometimes you get two or three. But this year, for uh, to your credit, you have answered the call for uh, for our input, uh, and we appreciate uh, the time that you have spent to come out. Thank you so much. Chair, I just had, you made a comment earlier about um, we've gone through this process for a, quite a few months now, and um, I, I don't know maybe we need to address how people can get that information as well um, because I think it's it's really important if people really want to dig into what we've been listening to um, and so that's my one comment the other comment is is that I'm glad that people are here because I think we've all been kind of trying to mull this over and trying to figure it out as well so um, thank you for your comments but I don't know where we could even could we post post some of that on our, our website um, as well I don't know The budget is posted on the, the website under finance and budgets. There's also a line item there. Um, there's been a few adjustments that don't show up in the line item in Schedule A and Schedule A1, but for the most part, uh, what's there is, is the budget. So people can go line by line um, and look at how money is spent or proposed to be spent. I think also what would be helpful for folks is the is to see the recordings of the meetings we've had in work session for every um, department and the division with every department. Um, it's each week's kind of a painstaking task and we're sort of in the culminating phase right now with the public input. But um, there's, a, there's a lot on our minds for a long time leading up to tonight. So if you want to share what is on our mind and have that level of detail, it's, it's absolutely there. And if anybody can't find it, um, reach out to the council office and we will put it, make it available to you. We will direct you directly to it. Sound good? 
Okay. And I would just add beginning May 10th is when you started your work sessions. All of those meetings are uh, attached to the agendas so you can watch them. Um, they're linked to, to, if you look at the agenda, there's a timestamp on them so you can see which pieces you want to hear. So if you don't want to hear the planning items that are in the meetings, you don't have to hear the planning items. You go straight to the budget presentations. Thanks, Janine. Any other comments or questions, feedback from the council? Okay, I think the level of attention the community has given this issue is absolutely sim symptomatic of the, the urgency of the issue. Um, we have done uh, public hearings in the past for tax increases. We've done truth and taxation hearings before, and we did not have this level of input or um, attention on it. And so um, that is not lost on, on us. So thank you for coming. And um, we still have uh, additional agenda items that are not related to the tax increase. You're obviously welcome to stay, but we're gonna move on to the next item, planning application and processing fee. And um, we'll bring up Bart and Briley, but we won't start right away until we give folks a chance to get back to family life. So, Barton, let's just take give him a moment. Yeah. While we're waiting for that, I mean, I don't know if we took notes. Of <laughs> Planners bring big personality. Yeah. That's what I've learned. <laughs> um, thanks, Brandon. Okay, um, for those, if there's anybody still watching, uh, Council Member Blair made a good uh, suggestion. We did hear a ton of feedback tonight. I think it'd be good if we started our next public hearing with a kind of a recap of what we heard. So we'll make sure to tee that up. Um, and we'll start putting out answers for some of the questions we heard. But okay, let's go to Mr. Riley. All right. Well, good evening, Chair Nadalski and council members. So we're going to talk about updating the planning fee schedule. And I want to just start with kind of a history of Ogden. You know, it's always been at a crossroads. And uh, we've chosen one road over another a number of times. And uh, that choice of road has led to everything that's good in Ogden. Uh, you know, the great architecture, great parks, great communities that we have. Uh, we've also... Uh, unfortunately, gone down some roads at times that have led to some not so pleasant uh, outcomes. And so I think we're at a crossroads again. And uh, I look at Ogden and with just the fabulous outdoor recreation opportunities we have. We have a really great business climate, fabulous downtown, great neighborhoods. I think Ogden, our path of choice is to become the best city in the West to live, work, and play. And I think we can really achieve that. Of course, that just doesn't happen. Uh, we've got to take an active role and do that. And the council has adopted a strategic plan, which will get us there. And four points in the strategic plan, economic development, city image and appearance, community safety, and recreation. And as planners, we're right in the middle of all of those. Uh, we talk about economic development. You know, just today I've been talking to a number of businesses who are looking at locating, expanding in Ogden. Um, the planners are often the first point of contact, and we're with them all the way to the, the ribbon cutting to get them in Ogden. City image and appearance is what we do every day, too. We look at every new development and make sure that it fits with uh, Ogden and is improvement to the community. Uh, we deal with community safety every day. That looking at new developments, making sure 
they're safe with traffic and sidewalks and crosswalks and they have fire access and the lighting and all that is part of our review. And recreation, we deal with recreation all the time, dealing with parks and trails and you know, I've sat in meetings on how do, can we improve this park. And so planning plays a, a vital role in all parts of your strategic plan. And what do we do every day? Uh, when we come to work, we want to support our citizens. We want to provide really great customer service. So uh, somebody coming in for a very small project or a very large project, we want to be able to help them. We want to support our businesses. They're the, really the backbone of our community and provide really great services to them. We want to support our development community, the people who are coming in and, and improving and building our community. We want to provide great customer service for them. And among all that, we want to plan for the future because those future plans will help them tomorrow with all those things. But what has happened over time is uh, we haven't invested as much in planning as we should. So uh, this just shows what the uh, staffing levels and planning over the years. And that has uh, really meant that we, we have to, had to delay or uh, cut short a lot of our long range planning efforts. And that's led to things like this. If you look at our general plan, it's a great general plan, and it talks about us being a city of 81,000 residents by 2020. And uh, clearly, we just haven't invested the resources. And with something like that, you know, how can we plan for the future, what we need for our businesses to thrive? What do we need for housing? What do we need for parks? What do we need for transportation? All those things. Uh, there's a lot of long-range planning that has been delayed. So we looked at ways, how can we get more resources to do the planning to help our community grow and to help achieve that vision? And we looked at our planning fees and just what we're taking in in applications and how much of that is uh, covering our costs. And our study showed that uh, our fees are covering about 13% of the cost of application processing. So in other words, uh, if a developer comes from out of town, they find a piece of property, they want to develop it, they're paying 13% of the cost of planning, uh, processing that permit, and our citizens and our businesses are paying the other 87% of that cost. So we looked at that, and also how do we compare, and this is just comparing against the top 10 cities in, in Utah. Uh, we are really at the bottom of the scale in what we charge for permit fees. Uh, impact fees, we talked about that in the um, work session. Uh, Ogden doesn't charge impact fees. Uh, we do, the Central Weber District does charge an impact fee, so if you develop in Ogden, you have to pay that impact fee. But this is a comparison against other communities just on a uh, per unit basis where we have uh, fees $8,000, dollars $15,000 per unit and uh, Ogden doesn't charge it. So being able to develop, the cost of develop as far as your fees is very, very low for Ogden. Martin? Yes. Did we ever charge impact fees and we eliminated them or we just never charged them? As far as I know, we haven't. I don't know. If we haven't in the last 30 years that I know of. Yeah. That's okay. about as far as my memory goes back. <laughs> okay. Where weren't you elected at statehood? I thought you'd know. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Greg left after 40 years. He could probably tell you what happened 40 years ago. So. <laughs> so okay, thank you. Yeah. So we looked at uh, what we could do, and a couple of years ago we were able to do a short-term budget increase to do two contract planners and to do a match for a uh, uh, Wasatch Front Regional Council grant. And that was a bump up of about $250,000 of additional revenue. So we looked at, well, what could we do to, to keep that going long-term? What would it take to raise about $250,000 additional revenue? And if we increased our fees to where we were covering about 54% of our budget, we would, we would cover that. And so, so we've proposed a fee increase which would get us that extra $250,000 revenue. Uh, one thing we're very sensitive to is uh, the small developer, the, the homeowner, uh, somebody who uh, 
uh, just wants to do a small addition to their property. So what we're proposing is a, a scaled fee. So that uh, right now, if you're a duplex or you're a 100 unit apartment complex, you pay the same fee. So we're proposing a scaled fee. So we keep it very low for a very small project and it increase for a larger project. Uh, same with uh, maybe a business that needs to do just a small addition to their property, it'd be a, a small fee. But if you had a very large, maybe a new retail building, it'd be a, a larger fee. And with the increases, uh, we're still sensitive. We didn't want to be the, the top of the chart on fees. So uh, just looking at these 10 jurisdictions, most of the fees out of the, those 10, we'd be somewhere between third and fifth or sixth on those fees. Uh, this is comparative for a 40-unit a apartment. And for a conditional use permit, you see we'd be uh, more in the pack on that instead of the low end. Um, as mentioned, the last one that we don't charge for a lot of things, and, uh, and we do spend a lot of time on very small permits. Uh, land use permit is like if you want a fence or a shed or something. Right now we do that without a fee. Um, we're not proposing a fee for those, because uh, frankly, if we charged a fee, it would just, we'd spend more time arguing about the fee than uh, actually getting permits and people just wouldn't come in and get them. So, uh, and historic reviews were proposing not charging a fee to encourage people to, to keep up their historic properties. Uh, we are proposing to start charging fees for things that we don't charge for now. Uh, residential vacation rentals, a planning inspection fee. So a lot of times we charge fees based on, okay, we get through the site plan review, we get to the planning commission, we give you your approval. Uh, but our work doesn't stop there. We have to go and do inspections on the property. We have to work on modifications. Uh, we go out a year later to make sure the landscape is still alive. We have to keep your records forever. So we're proposing an inspection fee that would be charged at the time of building permit. And one of the reasons we're doing this also is to, to keep that initial fee lower when it's still kind of, you're thinking about an idea, but once you get your building permit and when you're, um, when you got your construction funding, then you can put that into that part. Encroachment permits, extensory dwelling units, extensions and modifications, we'd all charge fees for. And altogether that would get us that $250,000 additional revenue. And we looked at what does this affect on development and I, did this uh, pie chart just to show you what percentage the planning fees are in a total project cost for like a, a 40 unit apartment complex. And I had a tough time getting the line to show up in the, the pie chart. So, um, but this is really the part that the developer community really depends on. It really depends on us providing that service, being there and, and uh, then getting their decisions and getting their reviews done quickly. So I believe that's, it will, be real benefit to development. So uh, we're recommending that you adopt the ordinance. Questions or comments? Questions for Barton. We'll start there. Jared, could you uh, uh, list the things that are not being charged for? You said sheds and uh, we'll get more what else? Fences? Yeah, a land use permit covers uh, accessory, residential accessory structures, fences, landscape changes. Okay, so, all right, okay. That, and that's pretty well it. Yes. Okay, yeah. thank you. And, and this other list is things that we don't charge for now, like residential vacation rental, but that we would begin. Chair, may I ask a question? You sure can. I'm just curious, have you gotten anything, um, any feedback from the public about this proposal? Uh, surprisingly little, um, and the couple feedbacks I've had is, have been very positive towards it, so. Okay, anyone else? I, I wonder, you know, the uh, vacation rentals mm -hmm. and uh, accessory dwelling units are, those are two things that, even though they've been free, People have not been very willing to come in and get their permit. Yeah, it's true. Now, this is not going to help. Um, are you going to do something to encourage people more? I, 
it sounds like we need a little bit more stick in this uh, in this process, a little less carrot maybe. Yeah. Um, the the biggest thing you can do is make it convenient for people. And so um, we're actually going through the residential vacation rental ordinance now, and we want to to make it more clear and better process so that uh, it, it's convenient and clear for people. Good luck. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. This is a public hearing. So if anybody cares to address the council on the proposed planning application and processing fees, this is your opportunity. Uh, just one fact, this Wilson Tolman, Ogden, Utah. One uh, fact that he mentioned that uh, when they were shortfall in their budgets, they cut out long range planning. That seems like just the opposite thing to do. Is if you're not looking down the road, you're gonna spend more money doing things over and undoing things. And I'd just like to mention that seemed like it was an oversight in the past. We shouldn't make those kind of oversights in the future. Thank you, Mr. Tolman. Good evening, Angel Castillo, Ogden resident. Um, I wholeheartedly support the changing of fees and, and I'm asking you to Go a little further, dig a little deeper, and figure out how we're going to use growth to pay for growth. Um, I point you to, who is it here that said not reinventing the wheel? Um, Idaho Falls. Their city council just passed uh, impact growth fees that are specifically dedicated for first responders, fire, police. And it's developers. It's not single family homes. It's new development. It's not someone who's doing a remodel. It's not someone who's getting a shed. Those are people who have already paid their impact fees. And while I am a fan of multifamily units along a transit line on edges of single family home residents, those should be significant because every single apartment dweller, water, sewer, power, every single family home water, sewer, power. So I encourage you to, to go a little further. Look at the tri-state area. See how they're understanding and getting creative with their type of financing. Because you can codify that specific percentages of fees go to specific things. And there's a revenue stream, and while it may fluctuate, it isn't fluctuating anytime soon. Um, we've seen tremendous growth, and we're worried about water. And this is one way to help mitigate our concerns about water and also fund what's important to us, public safety. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, was, Taylor Canoe Thaka, City spry. Resident. Um, what? <laughs> that was spry. Oh, okay. Welcome. Well, I got excited because I saw my house in the presentation. Yeah, I did. <laughs> and I actually wasn't going to speak on this. But I noticed that too. Since Sorry. I was there, I should say yeah. that I have great, I'm a rule follower um, through and through. And so in my historic renovations of that 132 year old house, I have always filed my permit with historic landmarks. Um, so I appreciate the carve out, that exemption. Um, what I will say is that my house is also loaded, located on the BRT route in a transit corridor. Um, and I have every intention of building an ADU and following the rules to do so. Um, in the same way, we're incentivizing small scale developers to do duplexes or eight units, um, I would appreciate a carve out, not only for myself, but for everyone considering adding density into our um, city, especially along transit corridors um, and waiving that ADU fee as well. Thanks. Thanks for following the rules, Taylor. I'm a rule follower. <laughs> good, good to know. <laughs> okay, anyone else? Not seeing any movement in the chambers and no hands raised online. Chair, I'd make a motion then that we close the public hearing on this item. Second. Motion by Councilmember Heyer, second by Councilmember Ritchie to close the public hearing. This is a voice vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Public hearing is closed. Comments or questions from Council? Chair, I'd make a motion that we adopt Ordinance 2022-36. Second. Okay. Uh, 
We'll skip the questions and comment. We'll go right to the proposed ordinance. We have a motion by Councilmember Heyer, seconded by Councilmember Blair to adopt proposed ordinance 2022-36. This is a roll call vote. Councilmember Blair. Aye. Councilmember Chaburka. Aye. Councilmember Heyer. Aye. Councilmember Ritchie. Aye. Councilmember White. Aye. Vice Chair Lopez. Aye. Chair Nadolsky. Aye. That passes. May, may I make a quick comment? Yes, you? please. Um, we were just uh, ruminating about the ADU um, addition and uh, yeah. Taylor's comment. And I totally, I think that's something we should think about, you know, maybe in re new iterations of the ordinance. Just, I was thinking about um, saying something that I felt maybe there's a little conflict of interest since I just built the most expensive garage in town. Um, <laughs> and now we know why your property My mother-in-law is living there now, so I don't need an ADU license, right. but one day somebody will. Um, anyway, so I was just contemplating whether that's too big of a conflict to bring up, but it might be something for everybody to consider. Yeah, I, I was hoping to have a little discussion about that one too before we took action, but that's okay. Um, yeah, I think it was it was good good point made. Any anyone else? Well, that's that has been a concern ever since we started doing ADUs. Is that it's just uh, we have I'm going to say hundreds, if not a thousand, in this town, and I don't know how many we've got licensed, but probably a little. Yeah, you know, probably less than your fingers and toes. And, uh, you know, they, they do serve a, a very valuable uh, place in our in our city, but they need to work right. They need to, you know, they need to function like they're designed to function. And um, I don't know how we can be a little bit more proactive to uh, to enforce that and to, you know, to get people incentivized to come in and get their permit. Um, but I hopefully we can kind of put our heads together and get that done because I, I think it's important. Okay, thanks. All right, I think we're good. Let's bring up Janine Eller Smith again for the mayor and council compensation discussion. Hopefully, she's feeling less verklempt, a little less pressure this time. A little bit. May I, may I make a quick comment? Sure can. I just wanted to respond uh, to someone like being critical of how you were talking to people. I really didn't notice that at all, and I really appreciated your thoroughness of your overview. Mm -hmm. So thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. So um, she's right. Right now, we're going to talk about mayor and council salary ordinance amendments. So this is salary ordinance. It's not the salaries themselves. So um, right now, the current ordinance for both the mayor and the the council state that the mayor's salary shall shall which means it has to be uh, adjust be adjusted by the percentage approved by the city council as a cost of living adjustment for non-merit special employees in the annual plan plan adoption pay plan adoption and similar languages in the council so the current budget that's been proposed does include those increases for the mayor and council, but you've had quite a bit of discussion about that and how uncomfortable you are uh, accepting those in pay increases. I think originally uh, the history behind it, you know, it became a time when there was hardly any, ever any ever any increases, but and if there were, it was a one percent or two percent cost of living, not thirteen, and so. This year is just kind of an anomaly. So the proposed language um, just adds a sentence that gives you uh, an option. Uh, so beginning in 2023, unless the city council adopts a contrary sal salary ordinance, the mayor's salary shall be adjusted by the percentage. So the percentage uh, increase, that the uh, cost of living increase that goes to employees will always be a default, but this gives you um, the, the uh, authority to adopt something different. So that's the mayor's compensation ordinance proposed language and similar language in the council compensation ordinance 2023 unless the city council adopts a contrary salary ordinance council member salary shall be adjusted annually by the percentage approved by the city council. So that is it. Two minor changes. Thank you for mm -hmm. presenting that. Any questions for Janine? I just, yeah. it just, I just have a, I, I don't know why it came to me. 
So when the mayor presents the budget, will the mayor have to present a, um, an increase for the employees and then an increase, I mean, will, will they have to do two separate increases or? Well, I think. I'm just trying to see that here. Because this, that this year process. you're gonna be taking separate actions on the employees salary right. pay scale and the elected officials. Right. And so I think if we ask them, they can just propose those separately in, in the coming I mean, ongoing. Uh, but like I mentioned right now, the default is the increase. Okay. So I, I understand yeah. that. I was just trying to see in future years, is that going to be something that the mayor will have to come and say, okay, you guys are, or we're going to get 5% and the employees are 15% or what I'm just throwing and out. Can now. I ask that same question another way? Maybe it'll help. Yeah, thank you. Uh, <laughs> is this going, is the old language going to kind of revert back into the norm? unless it's pulled back out again every year? No, this will be, this will be. It's separate. I think the norm going, going forward, yeah. so. So it will always be separate. So I, you'll always have the option to do something separate. It, it sounds like it well, gives the right. option yeah. for both I mean. administration and the council right. to make and it. Let's just, but unless it's pulled right. out, it, it wouldn't, it would just kind of ride along with the norms. Well, right. that, that's up to the mayor. He can propose whatever he wants. Or in the future, she can, and right. it's up to us to decide what we I just wondered how that was going to so, be right. go ongoing. So, yeah, yeah. yeah I, th I think the way the ordinance reads, and Gary's not here, he wrote it, but I think what it does is the, the, the default is with the increase, so that's probably what would be proposed with future budgets is with yeah. the increase, but this gives you the option to change it. Change it. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Jenny. Mm -hmm. I want 10%. No, yeah. Okay. Any other questions or discussion from the council? Okay. If not, we'll entertain action. Sure, I'll make a. Um, <laughs> what will I make? Oh. <laughs> um, I would like to adopt hour, proposed hour. ordinance 2022-37. Second. I have a motion by Councilmember Chaburka, second by Councilmember Ritchie to adopt proposed ordinance 2022-37. This is a roll call vote. Councilmember Chaburka? Aye. Councilmember Heyer? Aye. Councilmember Ritchie? Aye. Councilmember White? Aye. Councilmember Blair? Aye. Vice Chair Lopez? Aye. Chair Nadowski? Aye. That passes. Any, any comments or discussion on that item before we move to public comment? Chair, I... I I have, you know, as I reviewed the, the, the ordinance language, I, I'm, I'm okay with it. Um, I do think though that there was some things that uh, I, I think are important. Um, you know, it's been stated that this year is a bit of an anomaly with, with I think we could use the word hyperinflation going on. Um, and so that, that you know, uh, uh, elected officials really don't fit into the same cubby as, you know, sworn people and, and you know, the, the regular uh, salaried employees. Thank you for the word. Um, however, uh, we, you know, the council members do give value to the city. Uh, I think if we don't think we do, then we, are, we shouldn't be here. Um, and so I, I do believe that we are uh an asset to the city and and should be considered because inflation does affect us just as well, much as it does anyone else um the evergreen study uh did not take into account the amount of time that we spend on our our role uh ogden being an older city much more built out we uh spend oh i i don't know how, how we could compare with other cities, but our RDA, we spend a lot of time on RDA that other cities that are younger certainly don't, don't spend. Um, we are three weeks a month where nobody else that's even, that benchmarks with us is, is more than two. Um, and so I, I'm not sure how valid that evergreen benchmark study really is when it, when it comes down to it, it's just counting numbers is all it's doing. So I, I, uh, 
I was a little disappointed in our work session when after we had, you all, the, the leadership had met with the mayor in a joint session and had worked out a compromise uh, that I think everybody could have had bought buy in, uh, immediately turned against it in our work session. Um, it just seemed wrong to me. So I just, I'm just gonna say that in, in public and so that you got, guys all know how I felt about the way that went down. Sounds good. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, well, I, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. I <clears throat> since I was a part of uh, that that discussion, um, I I can just quickly respond to uh, uh, to your comments. And uh, I don't know why I'm having a hard time today with uh, all the stuff that we heard. And, uh, but, uh, so I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm a little emotionally drained, but, uh, uh I, I, my, my response is very simple, uh, council member Heyer, which is, um, you know, we, we, we all have our conscience and, um, when decision time comes to be in these dais, and voting on issues that are so important to us, you know, we vote our conscience. And uh, I think that all of us try to do the best we can uh, when we're doing the work, whether we're in leadership or whether we are not in leadership. And uh, I, you know, you have the right to be disappointed. I'm not refuting that one bit because that's your right. Um, I believe strongly that uh, we council members we we shouldn't raise our own salaries uh, and I don't know how I don't know I know it's not there's not an easy way or an easy answer to fix that uh, but I I see it as a conflict of interest it's it's to me personally and you know it's 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 uh, it is uh, a little bit uh, ridiculous honestly and I, I i i agree with your with your comment that we have value to the city of course we do absolutely and i, I really think we do but you know today we've heard a lot of comments from a lot of people that i think sometimes we forget about which is people that um that make a lot a lot less money than than other people and uh, you know, I've made the, I've tried to make the case in the past that, uh, but it's very complicated and that's why it's hard for me to address the topic at length and in depth because it's just so complex. But my argument has been that, you know, we, it's very hard for me philosophically to see elected officials and high paying executives making uh, uh, certain, certain, certain amounts of money that seem to be disproportionate with the incomes of people from our city. And you and I have had that debate a little bit and we disagree, mm -hmm. right? So, so I guess to, to summarize my comments, uh, we, we seem to have this culture on this council of agreeing to disagree. So I respectfully disagree with 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 the philosophy or the notion that we deserve to be paid another 13 percent uh or four percent uh as as elected officials i don't think we do and so uh but but i but i respect your your opinion greatly just just for just a clarification i wasn't proposing that the 13 percent was what i was putting toward mm -hmm. uh, but i thought the four percent uh, compromise that you all worked out was very reasonable. And um, so, you know, uh, anyway, that's, I, I, I don't, I'm not trying to disparage anybody either in my, no. you know, so, um, but, but I, I, and I don't, and I don't feel that way. Good. I don't really feel that way. I, I honestly believe that I, I applaud and respect your right to voice your opinion. So I, I thank you for that. Okay. So, so I, as the other council member that's in the room, um, Leading up to that day, 
I remember feeling like, I was like, I think I might be the only one that's opposed to the pay increases for ourselves. Mm. And went into that meeting thinking, well, I guess I'll buy off on a compromise because 4% is a lot better than 3%, 13%. Uh -huh. And then once we put it out to you guys that, hey, maybe we can come to some middle ground, we started to hear opinions from everybody and it was not what I thought. And so I thought I was going along to, with some kind of compromise very reluctantly because I just don't want to take any increase when we're doing this kind of consideration. But anyway, so I'll, I'll own how it went down because you're right, it didn't go down well. Oh, right. So you're, you're dead right there. Um, but I think at the end of the day, um, you know, we, we, like I said, in the work session following, we, we each have a vote and a conscience and I'm not going to hold your vote or your conscience against you. I think everybody's got a good, they're coming from the right place for their, for what they're think is right. So, um, enough just, about, just, sorry, real ahead. quick. Um, I was in that same meeting also, um, and I, I've got some things I'd like to share or like to, like to say, but I was just planning on waiting until we actually vote on it um, when, when on August 2nd. So I'll, I'll wait until then. I, I do appreciate Council Member Heyer speaking up, and, um, and I appreciate Councilor Lopez calling me and, and discussing that, that, that uh, proposed increase and where I felt and how I felt about all elected officials. So I appreciate that. Um, I agree we all have a... We all have one vote, or we all have one vote to make, and we all get to devote our conscience. and And I hope that it does. I hope that we all get the opportunity to speak freely and and be able to say things here or in the work session that um, that that's what we're doing. We're just we're just um, speaking our conscience or speaking our mind and 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 trying to work things out and trying to find middle ground. And that's all that is. And I appreciate the the dialogue that we've had and and. Um, but yeah, I, I have some other comments, but I'll just wait until August 2nd for that. So thanks. Okay. Thanks, Mark. Okay. Moving on to public comments. This is your opportunity to address the council on any topic or idea. You have been very patient Amen. tonight. Amen. Bravo. State I your made name. the mistake of not thinking of, of <laughs> watching at home and then coming <laughs> later. Yeah. I didn't up realize how long it was going to take. Uh, hello, my name is Lynn Carroll. Uh, I'm a resident of the third uh, district of Ogden. Uh, Mr. Ritchie, nice to see you in person. Um, our city's participation in the Community Renewable Energy Program is important because it reduces two of our biggest problems, global warming and air pollution with one program. Joining with other communities in the, pro in the program will cause Rocky Mountain Power to acquire more renewable energy faster. It will, will speed the day when we can stop using gasoline and natural gas for our vehicles and our heating, and our air will be much cleaner. At the same time, we will reduce our greenhouse gas pollution. So I just want to uh, confirm that Ogden City still intends to meet the July 31st deadline for your final payment for participation in the Community Renewable Energy Program. That's all. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We'll address that after we get the rest of the public comment. Hello, come on up. <laughs> what an exciting meeting. <laughs> My name is Jill Colford. I'm an Ogden City resident. I'm also um, the newest nominee in the Republican Party for House District 10. It's my goal to meet with all of the cities that are within District 10 in an effort to get to know you and let you know that I'm always here with an open door and hope that as I move forward to the house, because I have to talk like that, right? As I win this election, that we can work together to solve the problems that are facing all of our residents. So thank you for everything that you're doing. Louise has my contact information. I'll, I'll happily email everyone, but Louise, feel free to share. Um, because I would love to be able to talk to each of you about those things that are most important at the legislature for Ogden City. So thank you for your time, for everything that you do. And wow, what a meeting. Yeah. Yeah, you picked a humdinger. <laughs> Thanks. 
Yeah. You, you picked a humdinger. Thanks for, <laughs> thanks for sticking it out. That needs to come down. Nobody should see their face that big. <laughs> <laughs> Ever. <laughs> we'll let the cameraman know. <laughs> I'm Wilson Tolman. and I live by the Ogden River on Washington. <clears throat> Uh, UDOT is proposing and gathering information about making a four-way interchange on 24th Street overpass. I'm opposed to that. I suggested that they plow up the existing on and off ramp and see what the impact would be. But it's ridiculous to have <coughs> three off ramps within 10 blocks of Ogden City. I think we could spend more money, our money more wisely by working with North Ogden, trying to get them to work with us in building an overpass uh, to tie into the fourth North overpass. So then we will have a, a way to get across the railroad tracks when they when they, the UDOT puts through an overpass over the railroad tracks on 12th Street. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dolman. Okay, anyone else? Mr. Kunzler, welcome back. Yeah, Tyler Kunzler. I, uh, I'm actually in favor of uh, the increase for city council. Um, I think even easier would just be to peg it yearly to an inflation percentage so you don't have to have the conversation, especially when there's years where you're seeking an increase and, I mean, it's what it is. Um, is it okay to ask questions? I just want a question with uh, Ms. Smith. So when I'm paying, you know, the 24.5% property taxes that goes to uh, the Weber County for property taxes, is, am I wrong in the assumption that that is equally distributed between those percentages, like the pie chart that you showed in your graph? So we'll go ahead and ask all your questions. We'll, we'll just okay. So that, that was the first question I have. So yeah. if, or my next question would be is what percent of that 24.5% and that's give or take, that's based on just my calculations, probably similar to what you'd done. What percent of that actually already goes to Ogden city that becomes part of that budget? Cause as I look at that, it's, I view that as, okay, you're already getting a 24.5% piece of that pie then asking for an additional 18, 9%, or if you could direct me where I could find the information as to where that uh, percentage is broken down to, um, then I could research that and look at it on my own. Thank you for your time. Well, thank you. Okay. We got, we got movers on the left here. <laughs> um, it's me again. <laughs> Welcome back. Um, I wanted to say two things. Um, in my earlier comment, um, I got nervous. Also, my face up there made me nervous, so <laughs> I feel that. Um, uh, there are so many things that people come and ask for, whether it's a uh, community rec center. We joke about the sidewalks every single year. Please put on a fireworks show. All of the things. And, and then when, when the bill is presented, um, there's a disagreement there. And so I think... Um, Brandon, to Brandon's credit, has done a really great job showing um, the Make Ogden Downtown Plan and how um, the cost basis and then the tax basis has, and I think there's opportunity to kind of merge similar graphics and similar messaging for the city at large. And so I didn't quite make my full point, but that is something that I would like to share. And then similarly, um, in my role with the Ogden Downtown Alliance, um, my salary is super awkward and I'm underpaid. We participated in um, a national study of my, um, I'm 28% I'm underpaid um, in the state of Utah and I'm like 67% underpaid in, in a national scale. So I, I get this conversation. Um, but the thing that has been brought to me over and over again is replacing yourself. And so um, while I have elected to not change my own salary because it is awkward, I think existing in a panel and a body the way that you all are, I think is, is really important to think about the importance of the role that you are playing and the value of the role and needs to be an appealing and worthwhile position. Um, we are five hours into the time spent here today. This is, it, this is a side job that no one is getting. If you put your hours together, 
Um, I don't even think you're making a dollar per comment. Um, and so I think that it's really important to kind of consider um, the role that you all play um, and the impact you make in every single citizen's lives. Um, it's one thing to have a morality issue with that, um, but really to consider the importance of the role long term beyond just yourself in the seat um, is what I would kind of push back on that. I do appreciate um, the care and consideration there, but um, they're, they are important roles, and I think that it's important to recognize that um, with the budget. So thank you. Thanks, Kim. Thanks, Kim. And Kim. Thank you, Kim, and welcome, Kim. We get confused quite often. <laughs> uh, Kim Bouchard, Ogden resident. First, I would like to echo my support for the Community Renewable Energy Plan and that we support it. My businesses have signed on to that, and I just think it's very important. And I want to publicly um, express my support for that. I didn't know that uh, Kim was going to, I had no idea what she was going to say, but I really, you know, in my business, as I'm kind of looking to succeed, it's like succession matters. And I would echo that comment. Like, you know, you got to think about who's behind you and who's up for what you have been going through these last many years, but especially these last couple of years, it's just been crazy. And you have to think about that. Like it's very humbling. And I respect Luis's, you got about your conscience, um, but you got to think about what's next. And that might seem like a high executive salary or a high city council salary. Um, but you know, that's the, I just want to say that I need to replace myself and think about that, and so do you guys, and it's just that's what a good a good leader does. And I also just want to, I mean, I've been coming since February. Every time that I can, I think I've missed two, and it has been a wealth of information. It's been my honor. I actually get some work done on the side as well. And this city is run well, and it's fine, and I appreciate the opinions of people that don't have time to come and sit and listen like me every Tuesday, I don't either, but it's fun for me to learn. And, and I know that you have to take those comments with the grain of salt. And I have great respect for those that, all of them, all of those comments, every single one. And I just appreciate the time you're thinking and the thought and the care. And I thought those are really good comments shared by not only our police and fire and city employees, but our residents. And I really appreciate my friend here, he's always got some nice comments to add. So just thank you for what you do. And I think we're going to be off for the next couple of weeks until August 2nd. Is that right? Yes. All right. Thank you. you you'll, you'll be off. Yeah. Uh, Taylor Knuth, Ogden City resident. Um, I am just chatty tonight, apparently. I really try to listen more than I talk, but um, I wanted to echo what the Kims said. Um, <laughs> so I uh, think you all should also get a raise. Maybe the 4% council member hire was speaking about earlier. Um, the stay-at-home parent that may want to engage in city council one day, uh, you all have second, this is your second job, but the stay-at-home parent that wants to be on council one day will have to make great sacrifices to be here three times a month. Um, and that should be compensated fairly. I bet if you did the math on your hourly wage, you probably aren't making a livable wage at this point. So um, voice of my support there. The second thing I want to talk about is something that I haven't heard talked about in council meeting over the last few months, and that is the issue of uh, fires. There are currently five fires raging in Utah, uh, costing taxpayers thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars to fight these unnecessary fires that have all been man-made and several made by fireworks. It is laughable that the current uh, fi residential fireworks restriction map can be compared to Centerville's firework <laughs> restriction map, um, and they still encountered a firework caused um, fire on their side of the mountain. Um, I would encourage this body to seriously deliberate in the public forum the merits of a, a citywide residential ban on fireworks, especially as we're talking about fiscal conservatism and wanting to be proactive in our leadership styles and engage um, in, in important dialogues about how we can save the city money because a fire on the side of that mountain will cost thousands, if not tens and hundreds of thousands of dollars Third thing I'm going to say is I sent this body an email about this topic not too long ago, and I only received one response from the council members. I have heard you all um, pontificate about the importance of engagement with your constituents, 
but I find it incredibly disappointing that none of you took the time to engage with a concerned resident myself and several others who I know um, reached out. So this, a solution to this would be to include perhaps a constituent liaison on your staff who can handle your emails and respond to constituents when these concerns are raised. Um, I think that it's the least you can do to acknowledge the public comment that you receive via email or phone call um, when those comments are made. I think it's just a simple sign of respect to your constituents. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, anyone else in the chambers? Angel Castillo, Ogden resident. There's always got to be one in the room. I completely disagree with the salary portion. Um, Utah is an extremely fiscally conservative state, and it's done us well getting us through these upturns. And our legislators work 45 days and make $12,825. You work 36 days. And I know all of you know people on the Hill, have good relationships with people on the Hill. Some of you have worked on the Hill, and I know you know how hard a job that is. And I know your jobs are hard, and I know that you have full-time jobs and families, but we're not the state legislature. I, I, I just don't feel right that you should be making more than state legislators are making in our state. I feel as if you're either gonna take the stand, we're all in, and we're gonna be a full-time city council and we're gonna appropriately pay people so teachers could actually do this because being able to serve this second part-time job is, is a privilege and it's an honor to serve the city and all of you and many people here who serve on other committees and boards are in privileged positions to do so. They're, they're, it's an honor because they can, but there are people in the city with great value of perspectives that only make $60,000 a year or $45,000 a year. Let's talk about teachers and fire and police first year. Those folks could never burn to serve their community and put food on their table. So either you're all in with the Utah way of being fiscally conservative and serving from a genuine calling and, and doing what you do and doing the honorable thing to make sure that others eat before you, or you're gonna go full time and you're gonna allow diversity of thought and voice and economic, socioeconomic status, your choice. But I, I just, it feels disingenuous after everything that we heard here. And I know all of you, because all of you do reach out to your constituents and do have conversations. And, and it may take you a little bit to get back, but you all do. I haven't yet to have one person here not follow up with me. It may take a minute, but it, but it happens. And it's because you're busy professionals and you have lives and you have families and you're, and you're juggling. And I appreciate that. So all in or all with letting others eat before you. That's what I ask you to consider. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else in the chambers? Okay, we'll go to Heath Sato online. Hi, Heath Sato, Ogden resident. Uh, first off, I'm glad you guys had the courage to show up for these hard conversations when the mayor didn't. That's kind of pathetic in my opinion, but anyways. Breaking from the budget talk, let's talk environment. Of the top 25 record high temperatures here in Ogden since 1948, all of them have been in recent years, most in just the last two years. The top three were last year. Some weather forecasts say we could possibly hit a blistering new record of 109 degrees on Pioneer Day this month. There's a pattern here. And that's to say that we need to really dig in towards not just addressing our drought, but getting ahead of it. Push harder on state leaders, please. Anyways, speaking of extreme temperatures and getting ahead of issues instead of chasing them, I could tell many hearts were deeply touched by Anna Whitnack Davidson's presentation to you during the work session today. She has been an incredible advocate for people experiencing homelessness since long before she was employed by the city. She is literally a lifesaver. 
I think you now better understand how many lives in that situation are truly fragile and even the slightest push away from the little stability they have in their lives can lead to consequences most of us cannot even imagine. You heard about real stories of people losing fingers and toes, committing suicide, dying of exposure to the elements. These consequences are always a possibility when things are on such a razor's edge. So I wanted to take this opportunity to remind everyone of the community's outrage in December of 2020 when the administration chose to uproot a lot of people's temporary shelters as the day was getting colder and darker on what was the coldest night of the year so far. The response seemed to be that I and others were overreacting, but I have a different view now. I, I, I realize how many people just don't realize how incredibly fragile these lives can be. So I hope all your hearts were moved in that meeting and that turns into action. Uh, I, ne I need to say that I disagree with CAO Mark Johnson's idea that essentially we should wait until other cities just get the message that we aren't going to solve the problem alone and that then they'll start handling the overflow. I respectfully disagree. That's what we've been doing. It's not working. And once again, I disagree with the mayor that we actually have a surplus of housing that's affordable here in Ogden. Again, you just heard in Chambers tonight how much more expensive housing is here now than just even a couple years ago. What we need is leadership that will engage the cities around us and convince them that we need to work together on this issue and the water issue. And not just to make our cities better, but to help people and save human lives. If anyone knows the president of the Utah League of Cities and Towns, I hope you'll convey this message to him. I think the league would be a fantastic place to figure out how our cities to work better together on this. I'll add this, I used to live in a place where individual cities address the issue on their own and try to just push the overflow of people without homes off on their neighbors. I've seen how this movie ends and spoiler alert, it doesn't work. Things will get worse, much worse. Thank you for listening and I hope you'll take action. Thank you, Heath. Next up is David Timmerman. Hello. This is Dave Timmerman. Can you hear me? Sure can. Can you hear us this time? Yes, I can. This time. I always have problems. Um, thank you very much, first of all, for uh, taking the time. I'm here also to speak on behalf and sort of as a summary of the uh, what started as the Clean Renewable Energy Act and which is now being called the CREP. You know, everybody likes a nice CREP or crepe, I guess. Um, anyway, as you know, uh, you guys commissioned a survey which occurred last in the last year. Uh, over 70% of uh, people living in Ogden that responded to that said they were supportive of uh, increases to access renewable energy. 45% of our respondents were supportive of achieving 100% clean energy by a community renewable energy program compared to just 9% who opposed it. Importantly, a majority of Ogden residents said they'd be willing to pay more for renewable energy on an average of up to 9.3% of the cost. Ogden, as you know, is one of 18 cities brave enough to participate in this program to have 100% clean energy by 2030. Together with these communities, we will equal about 25% of Rocky Mountain Power's total energy used, which is large, largely created by coal and uh, gas extraction. Ogden's second and final administrative payment to the community will be, I guess, a little over 37000 almost $38,000, which is due by July 31st. Um, I just want to remind us all that this will reduce the energy we're using by 500,000 tons of carbon pollution, which is leading to all of the excess of heat and lots of other ongoing uh, issues which are affecting us greater than most of the country, but uh, definitely affecting the entire country and the entire world. The payment equals to just 41 cents per Ogden resident, which is a very small price to pay for the option to achieve net 100% clean energy for a population that has indicated a strong social and financial preference for it. <clears throat> Continued participation ensures that Ogden residents will be able to finish the program design process 
understand the right impacts of the program and preserve the opportunity for Ogden to eventually codify the program by passing an ordinance early next year when all financial impact can be clearly assessed. No Ogden resident or business energy bills will be impacted during the program design. There's no risk to continue participation at this time. Please authorize the 41 cent per resident payment to keep the clean energy options open. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Timmerman. Okay, uh, next up is Ed McKinney. Good evening. How about a sound check? We can hear you. You hear us? Okay. Yeah, I can hear you. Great. Perfect. Thank I'm you. I'm Ed McKinney, Utah, past uh, airport advisory committee member and current president of Ogden Regional Airport Association. Last week, I mentioned the airport manager's comments are without scrutiny and validation, especially since the airport advisory committee is made up of uh, Weber State University friends of Ogden City that know little or nothing about aviation or the airport. Um, I made an offer to provide resources that can provide input um, <clears throat> on the millions of dollars that you're spending. And I've heard nothing from uh, anyone on the city council, I'm very disappointed about that. Uh, tomorrow night is an airport advisory committee meeting at 6 p.m. at the airport terminal. I encourage the city council or a uh, few of you to attend to see what I'm talking about, um, <clears throat> especially since this is a uh, an opportunity to see uh, what happens when you have some a group of advisors that are not subject matter experts. And I uh, sincerely hope that one or two of you, or three of you might consider attending, especially in light of uh, Mr. Garrett's comment that he would have Ogden Airport at 90% of what Provo is in uh, 18 to 24 months, which is a um, very uh, unreasonable goal. But how do you know? So I think if you uh, have the opportunity, please tune in tomorrow night, uh, not tune in, but attend. And I appreciate the opportunity to speak in front of you uh, for what has been a very interesting meeting tonight. Thank you all. Thank you, Mr. McKinney. Anyone else online? Anyone else in the chambers? Okay. Comments from the mayor and or CAO this evening on behalf of the mayor. Thanks, Chair. Um, an oh, update. Oh. Yeah, we'll yeah, also I, stop. Thanks. Oh, yeah. No, no, I'm so sorry. I just didn't know if we were going to respond sorry. to any of the questions. We, we did. We had. We're getting sleepy. Do you, you, I know I am. <laughs> um, do you want to address any feedback from the from the public comment on your remarks, Mark? I, w I will on fireworks. Okay. And fire. Okay. Um, and then we'll give Janine a chance when we get to the council comments, say it. Get to Mr. Consular's questions. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I'm just making sure. I'm sorry. I know. I'm sorry. Um, fireworks and fire. We we're very conscious of the fact that um, things have dried out a lot since the 4th of July. Um, I know of no one in the state of Utah who studies that more than um, Chief Matthew. Talked to fire department this morning, um, lobbying us to change where the fireworks can be let uh, used is um, not as fruitful as lobbying the state legislature. They have set rules that are very difficult for us to work around. Last year, we just ignored them and we got warned, don't do that again. So um, we, we have gone as far as we did. We even uh, altered the map a little to include um, a little further down the mountain um, on, out on the north side of town. But we don't dare do any more. We're hoping um, the firework companies tell us that people pretty well spend most of their money on the 4th. And by the time the 24th comes, they don't have as many um, people buying fireworks. But we really need to have the state law include um, drought, water content in the trees and in the bushes and things like that. And it, it doesn't have any of that in there. 
we're going to work on lobbying that, but I, I would invite citizens to do the very same. Uh, we had a future, potential future uh, member of the House here earlier, and it, it's not a bad idea to start putting that in their ear that um, we can't afford the water right now to fight a fire. So uh, we're aware of that, but we're going as far as we can go with what the state allows us to do. A um, couple of the comments. Um, this coming weekend at Farmer's Market, and Farmer's Market is amazing, but we also have Farm in the City, and we only get that one time a year, and that's usually on Pioneer Day week. So if you have kids or grandkids, um, it is a great time to come and bring them down to see the animals. My grandkids, pardon? Oh, there's no animals, tractors and, okay, farm equipment. Uh, my grandkids have enjoyed that several times when we brought them down to that, and that's kind of a fun part, I think, of Pioneer Weekend, um, of um, um, the events on the weekend. I just want to say a little bit about Triple Crown. It was brought up earlier. Um, this is amazing for our community that's here. This is Fast, fast Pitch uh, Girls Softball that's here. Uh, we have people from all over the state. They started here yesterday in the amphitheater and then walked over to Linquist Field and enjoyed a, a game with uh, women on both teams. It was kind of a, what was that uh, movie? League of Their Own? Yeah, it was kind League of, of a League of Their Own. But I drove around the parking lot when I left about 6 o'clock, and I couldn't believe how many states were represented on the license plates of the cars that were here. We have all the hotels filled in Weaver County. We have many filled in Davis County. Uh, we have families here just spending money. There might be a little longer time when you want to go to one of the restaurants in town for the next few days, but it's wonderful that they're coming in and experiencing uh, Ogden. Uh, what's not recognized and should be recognized by you is Jay's pretty much co pulling all his crews in from all his teams because the field has to be redressed between every game. There's, there's specific <laughs> guidelines that we are given to be able to host this, this tournament. Um, we have opportunity to increase the amount of tournaments will come in the future. So the job that we do is selling for future opportunities. So I, I congratulate Jay's people. They're gonna be putting a lot of work into it and just so happens that that is one of the departments that spends a fair amount of time on the rodeo and the parade, which is coming the next week. So we really appreciate them. Police department does a lot. Fire department does a lot when it comes to the rodeo and the parade. We hope you'll be a part of it, that you'll encourage people to come out and be part of it. In my opinion, we have one of the best parades and rodeos in the state of Utah. We're one of the top five rodeos in the nation. And it's a great opportunity for people to come and to enjoy um, we had some people here from Australia a couple years ago, and they were blown away by the beauty of the rodeo grounds and the rodeo. Um, I was, it was fun to see that they posted about 150 pictures from the rodeo that night on social media talking about what an amazing event it was. But we put on these amazing events, but our employees put a lot of time and effort into making them happen. So we really appreciate that very much. Um, I've enjoyed the comments that have been made tonight. It's been interesting. When I was city council member back in 2002, we would have killed to had this many people in the chambers. Um, we couldn't figure out how to get it done. So I applaud you because, um, of course, we never did a property tax increase. But I applaud you for um, your diligence at seeking people to come and to give comment. I think it's the right way for government to run. And I think... Um, you figured out a secret that my city, can the council I served on, didn't figure out. So um, I thank you, and I thank the people who came earlier. Thanks, Mark. Council members, I'll start with uh, Janine. If you're, if you've got some feedback for Mr. Concert's questions. So I'm not sure. I'll, I'll be honest. I'm not sure exactly what you're talking about. The 24 percent. I think the only calculation you can do with the information that's on the website now is the change in valuation from 21 to 22 because they do give those two differences and then you can calculate which uh, taxing entities uh, are a percentage of the whole right so uh, if you look at what you paid there's a drop-down box on the 
that shows you every taxing entity and, and the amount that you paid to them. So you can calculate the percentages there. So in 2021, Ogden City's percentage of the whole was 17.4% or something like that. So I'm not sure where the 24%, if you're talking about Weber County, that you know they do have a higher, higher percentage if you count in uh, the library and uh, uh, Weber Morgan Health and a few other things that are sort of county related. Yeah, so the question was, in the increase in property you know, taxes in let's, general. Let's take this one off sorry. offline. Okay. We'll just, you guys can, okay, that's okay. You guys can get all wonky with it afterward. <laughs> um, I was actually confused on the 24 and a half percent too. Yeah. So if you can get, you guys can put your minds together. Um, okay. Let us know what, it, what came out of it. That'd be great. Comments from council members? Looking over here first. Come on, sister. I'll just be really brief, but um, I appreciate the comment about the fire restrictions, but I, I disagree. I think that last year we um, did our due diligence to protect the community and save our resources and be fiscally responsible. And um, the governor plainly said that it was our responsibility last year. So um, I think that we could do a lot more there. And um, just a point about the council and elected officials uh, salary increases we talked a little bit about this in the work session as well and uh, normally I totally support getting the same increase as everybody else because I totally believe we're valuable and that we do want to make space for others to serve it's just that we just did the benchmarking study and 13 percent was too much for me to stomach so that's just basically my perspective there thank you we did get some feedback about Korea um, you, you're kind of representing the council on that committee. Is there any feedback you can give? Um, um, all I can say is the deadline to pay is the end of July, and we don't meet until August. So. <laughs> okay. Okay. I think we're undecided, so we'll be working on that. We. Well, someone said we're off for two weeks. We've got two weeks of a ton of work to do, actually. We won't be in here for two weeks, but we've got a lot of work to do. That's obviously budget related, but also CREA related. So we've got a deadline looming that we're going to have to answer to. Anyone else comments or questions on anything else? I have a comment. I, yeah. Yeah. I'll go ahead. I have just a couple of comments. Um, first of all, um, I got Dan Beatty that was here last week, who's super excited to do the flip the strip program is still trying to get in contact with us and Weber Basin and still getting the runaround that they're waiting for the city council to approve that. I'm just curious about how that's shaping out. So we, um, we've we signed the agreement. We have the sign ordinance. Um, we've been meeting with Rock, uh, Weber Basin and we should be starting probably Monday it would okay. be. Would be. Um, it took a little while. To, it has to go through their board, and they have to sign it, and they haven't signed their part of the agreement yet. So until they do, we can't really start. So I think we're really, really close. We've done everything on our side that we need to do. We're just waiting now for them to say thumbs up, and then we'll go. Perfect. And then I just had one other comment, and I wish I would have got um, Kim Bouchard before she left. But last week she was here, and, of course, she serves for the Weber Basin on their board, and... and she met with Dan, and that just meant a lot. And he came in and talked to me about it, about how much that meant to him and how excited he was. And she took the time to do that. And I just, I mean, every time that I interact with residents of our city and, and all that they do, it just, I'm, I'm amazed. And, and, and Kim Bouchard is no exception. I'm, I'm just amazed at the time and effort she puts into making our city better. And, and um, I just wanted to publicly thank her, and I'll reach out and thank her too. But it was, it was great for her to take the time to do that and, and and meet with Dan as not only she was interested as a citizen about what he's done, but also um, as a member of their board, she was also excited to get him in contact with who she needs to get in contact with and, and get him on that path also. So I just wanted to publicly thank um, Kim Bouchard for, for, for that. Thanks. Anyone else? Uh, are, are we going to have uh, the option by chance, I don't know if, any of you know or Janine if it's for you but is there going to be an option to 
vote on the 4% increase for council members and mayor, or we haven't, we haven't, uh, that won't be? I think we can, um, I'll relieve you from the awkward position you're in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess it depends on what Ben directs to go on. Yeah. Okay, so, so then, then my, my comment will be then just very short, which is, um, you know, this discussion, I, I don't know if I'm right, right? I keep saying about speaking your conscience. So if anybody believes that you have the right to figure out a way to vote, make a motion, or have something on the agenda to vote on the 4% increase, by all means, go ahead and please figure out a way to do that because, you know, uh, you, you, you have your right to do that. I'm hearing it here. I'm hearing it here. I'm hearing it from a bunch of people that came up and support and supported that. And, and, and so one way or another, you know, that can fall whatever, whatever, wherever it needs to fall. So uh, I, I know it's late, so I'll stop there. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Um, yeah, we can, we, we have the ability to vote on whatever we want. I, I personally, I just want to vote on it. So I, I, I commit to respect whatever outcome it is, I promise you. Yeah. So, okay. Um, motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Motion by Council Member Heyer, second by Council Member Lopez to adjourn. This is the voice of all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? We're adjourned momentarily for the redevelopment agency meeting. I gotta walk. Still have reflect that all board members are present. First item on our agenda is a pu public hearing for fiscal year 2022-2023 budget amendment. I think we have Justin. <laughs> you poor bugger. Justin. Thanks for I'm still awake. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, man. I, my wife wouldn't say it's past my bedtime. I stay up way too late some nights. So <laughs> thank you, board members, for um, this opportunity to come before you tonight with this proposed resolution 2022-6, uh, amending the Ogden City Redevelopment Agency budget um, in the fiscal year 2022-2023. Um, we, we had we'd hoped to try to get this done before the end of last fiscal year, but timing didn't allow us to, to get this budget opening to you in time. And so we're bringing it for you tonight um, to be able to amend that budget as the, the fiscal year 2022-23 RDA budget was adopted uh, in early June. Um, what this budget opening is for is it's mainly a cleanup. Um, to clean up several of the expired districts um, that still have some tax increment in it that we haven't yet transferred out, as well as some cleanup in some existing uh, tax increment districts that we need to also transfer out. And so, as you can see here, the first portion is um, a transfer to the CBD mall from several districts. If you'll recall back in, in 2007, um, the the city, or the, re, the, the redevelopment agency was able to um, with, under state law, they were able to take a, a portion of some of this in, increment to go towards the debt of the, the Solomon Center and um, I lost my train of thought, uh, the American Can. And so th what this does is it's taken the, there's several, as you can see, that they're expired districts. It's the, it's the it, what this is, is the amount that we've received over and above what had been budgeted um, in prior years and recognizing that 
um, and then transferring it to uh, the CBD mall for uh, their for the debt service uh, to put into reserve there um, to be able to use there. And that that debt payment, um, the retirement of that one is in 2027. So we're getting close on that. The other portion, and and so you can see there, the total amount is just over a million dollars going into the to the CBD mall. The other portion of this is to recognize um, in existing entities. Um, extra increment that we had not done so, and then transferring out. There are, as each entity is created, there's certain requirements established for administrative costs, um, and then portion that would go to housing. And so this portion is taking the tax increment, tax increment that has not been recognized, recognizing it, and then transferring it based on those agreements to the, to the admin, to, for administration costs or um, to the housing fund. And then also there is a portion in, in the Ogden River RDA, the Trackline RDA, the Kiesel RDA that leaves a portion in there for development agreements um, that already exist. So the total, or, and, and there's one other portion, sorry. Um, the, the DDO area, which expired a couple years ago, um, we're also recognizing additional tax increment received there. And that one is specifically used for the BDO. And so this is to recognize that, and then we would transfer that money out of, of the DDO area, and it would need to be received into the uh, BDO infrastructure um, fund. Um, at this time, we'll, we'll need to come forward with another budget opening to recognize this for the city, as well as also the, the administration portion as well. So for tonight, um, this budget opening, the total amount, uh, the total appropriation is just over $8.4 um, Again, uh, the for your consideration tonight to for this budget opening. So any questions? Thanks, Justin. Questions for Justin? Just a comment on how quickly you did that. Good job. <laughs> it's a lot of money, but it's a lot of cleanup to take care of. So thank you. And this will also, I forgot to mention, this will also, on all those expired districts, it will finally close them um, to get those taken care of off the books. So yeah, nicely done. We will consider a 13 percent ish raise for you for that. <laughs> Appreciate it. Thanks. <laughs> okay, thanks, Justin. Any any questions for him? Okay, this is a public hearing, so if you care to address the board on this item, the fis fiscal year 2022-2023 budget amendment, um, this is your opportunity to address the board. Seeing none, we can entertain an action on the motion that we uh, close the public hearing. Second. Oh. Well, we have a motion by board member Hire, second by board member White to close a public hearing. This is a voice vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Like... Let's close. Chair, I also make a motion that we adopt resolution 2022. Second. Motion by board member Hire, second by board member Lopez to adopt proposed resolution 2022 6. This is a roll call vote. Board member Hire. Aye. Board member Ritchie. Aye. Board member White. Aye. Board Member Blair? Aye. Board Member Chaburka? Aye. Vice Chair Lopez? Aye. Chair Nadolsky? Aye. That passes, thanks. Chair, can I make a motion that we uh, move item four, up before item three for this point? We just were uh, meeting, meeting, meeting expedition. Expediency? Expediency, that's right. Oh, I can't. That works. We have a second on that? Second. We have a motion by board member Hire, second by board member Ritchie to move item four uh, to preceding item three. This is a voice vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes. Comments from the executive director? Nothing tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. Council, uh, comments from board members? I just wanted to say how much I appreciate Janine putting together the development um, process or the developer you know, selection process. I look forward to talking about it more later. Perfect. Thanks. Anyone else? Okay. Moving on to the closed executive session. Chair, I make a motion that we uh, adjourn into a closed session for one of the items listed. Second. A motion by board member Hire, second by board member Ritchie to adjourn into a closed executive session for one of the reasons listed on the agenda. This is a roll call vote. Board Member Ritchie? Aye. Board Member White? Aye. Board Member Blair? Aye. Board Member Chaburka? Aye. Board Member Heyer? Aye. Vice Chair Lopez? Aye. Chair Nadolsky? Aye. That passes. 
just so the public is aware, we will adjourn from the closed executive session and from the redevelopment agency meeting from within the closed session. So this is all you'll see of us tonight. Thank you so much.